Chapter 71 Fourth Year June Saturday, 28th of June, 1975 Hi, Remus! Lily startled him as he was leaving the hospital wing. He'd just had his final checkup with Madame Pomfrey before school ended. Hello, he said nervously. What are you doing here? Dropping these off for Professor Slughorn. She raised a large jar of something that looked like purple frog spawn. We've been doing healing potions in Slug Club this term. Wait here, I'll walk back with you. She disappeared inside the infirmary and he waited, trying not to look too suspicious. He hated being seen near the hospital. Lily finally came out with a breezy smile. Thanks. What were you doing in there? Oh, nothing. I, um, a hex that went wrong. Oh, gosh. What happened? Uh, I'd rather not say. He raised an eyebrow suggestively, hoping that she would get the picture. Fortunately, her mind went elsewhere. Was it Potter again? Ugh. He hexed Sev last week with something that made his neck swell up like a life ring. Uh, yeah, James is good at engorgement charms, Remus grinned. Well, I wouldn't have thought he'd hex the people who are supposedly his friends, Lily replied primly. It wasn't him, Remus replied, annoyed. He was not keen to badmouth James in front of Lily after the mix-up back in January. Black, then, Lily shrugged. He's just as bad. No idea why everyone fancies him. Mmm. So, big plans for the summer? Lily changed tact, perhaps realising that Remus didn't particularly enjoy her tirades on the other marauders. Nah, Remus shook his head. Usual stuff, probably. Homework. You? I'm going to visit Marlene in July. We're trying to get Mary to come. How is she? Mary had been absent from every meal since the big breakup and had barely left the girl's dorm as far as Remus could tell. Better, Lily nodded sadly. She can go a few hours without crying, anyway. Keeps playing depressing Dusty Springfield albums, though. They reached the portrait of the fat lady and bumped into Peter. And Desdemona Lewis, of course. They were in a tight embrace, arms wrapped round each other, murmuring between kisses. I'll miss you, she sighed. I'll miss you more, Peter said. Will you write? Every day. Remus made loud retching noises, which made Lily giggle, but earned a furious frown from Peter. They quickly climbed through the portrait and left the lovebirds to it. Gryffindor Tower was complete anarchy when they reached it, as was usual on the last day of term. Students crawled under tables looking for lost things, ran round collecting up cards and game pieces, shouts of, Asio left trainer, or Asio wristwatch, rang out as everyone scrambled to pack up at the very last minute. Remus couldn't help but wonder whether every common room was undergoing the same pandemonium. Surely the organised Ravenclaws were in a much better state. Sirius and James were not doing much to help the process. They were covertly levitating various items from behind one of the larger armchairs, snickering to each other happily. Remus smiled, thinking again how much he would miss everything. You too, Lily scolded them, marching over, holding her own wand up. Sirius laughed and ducked behind James. Come on, Evans, just a bit of last day, high spirits. Why can't you just leave people be, Black? Why can't you just leave us be, he retorted, firing green sparks at the ceiling away from James's back. You're not a prefect yet, you know. Oh, just wait till I am, she said, trying to throw a jinx at Sirius. It hit James instead, and turnips immediately began sprouting from his ears, the shocked expression on his face so comical that Remus collapsed into giggles. Well, that wasn't so goody-goody, Sirius laughed, transfiguring a nearby lamp into a flock of birds, which fluttered screeching across the room, adding to the chaos. Lily's next move was to shoot a jelly legs jinx at James, causing him to fall to the floor in a heap, still clutching his turnip ears. With him out of the way and Sirius exposed, Lily disabled him with a binding spell, then turned to Remus. Help me sort all this out, will you? Okay, fine, Remus sighed, still wiping tears of laughter from his eyes. Together they managed to restore the common room to order, detransfigure the lamp, repair the singe marks on the ceiling, and calm down a wailing first year who'd lost her cat. Lily left Remus to handle James and Sirius, who are in a real state now. Isn't she marvellous? James grinned dopily as Remus tried to help him into a nearby chair, his legs still unsteady, folding underneath him. 
Yeah, real charmer, Sirius grumbled, struggling to get free from his body bind. You two are just lucky she only used her power for good, Remus chastened them. You'd be no match for her if she decided to really start breaking the rules. Finite! He pointed his wand at Sirius, who was finally released. He rubbed his arms fiercely. Can't believe you helped her, Mooney! Of course I did, Remus shrugged. I'm terrified of her. Sunday, 29th of June, 1975. Oh, you two will miss the train! Remus huffed, climbing the stairs to their dorm for what felt like the hundredth time that morning. Their trunks had already been transported down to Hogsmeade Station by some magical mechanism, and McGonagall had given the ten-minute warning, but James and Sirius had vanished again. He found them sitting on James's bed, which was stripped of bedclothes, heads bowed over something small Sirius was holding, cupped carefully in his hands. The room felt horribly hollow and empty without all of the marauder's things in it. The two black-haired boys turned to him as they entered, and Remus felt he'd intruded on something very private. He hung back a moment, awkwardly. Sorry, Mooney, James smiled, climbing off the bed. We're ready, eh, Black? Yeah, of course. Sirius got up, too. He had a dazed, distracted expression which made Remus ache on the inside. Look what James gave me, Sirius said as he crossed the room. He held out something round and silver. Remus took it. It was warm from Sirius's hands. It was a compact mirror, beautifully etched with an ornate filigree-style design. Uh, Remus turned it over, snapping it open. Very, um, pretty? James laughed. It's magic. Belonged to my granddad. Look! He opened his own identical compact and looked into it. Remus looked down at Sirius's mirror and was amazed to see James's bespeckled face grinning back at him. So we can keep in touch over the summer. Oh my god, Remus exclaimed. That's amazing. I know, James nodded, closing his compact and slipping it into his back pocket. Wish I could have got them for all of us, but they're old family heirlooms and there's only two. Oh, of course. Remus handed the corresponding case back to Sirius. There was an awkward few seconds silence before Remus cleared his throat. Come on, McGonagall's going to hex us into next week if we miss the carriages. They did make the carriages and the train on time, and piled into their usual compartment. Remus was most disconcerted to find that this year their little carriage space was packed full of people. Not only the four marauders, but of course Desdemona was invited to join them. Remus had still not heard her say more than two words, possibly because her lips were so often occupied. Mary joined them too, at Sirius's request. He'd been paying her a good deal of attention over the last few days, and it was obvious she was rather enjoying it, having recently taken a heavy knock to her confidence. With Mary, as always, was Marlene, and finally Lily, who would have been forced to sit alone otherwise. As such, it was an incredibly noisy ride back to London, between Sirius trying to impress Mary by singing every Beatles song he knew, James switching between trying to attract Lily's attention and talk Quidditch tactics with Marlene, and Peter and Desdemona's fevered fumblings. Remus simply sat back against the window and enjoyed being among friends for what might be the last time in a very long time. He tried not to think about the war or who might go missing over the summer. He tried not to think about Sirius, alone and abused in a cold London mansion. He tried not to think about Ferox, off on dangerous missions for Dumbledore. He just watched his friends, their faces bright and animated, full of excitement and emotion. He rubbed the back of his head sleepily. His skin had cut had grown out, and he had a pile of mousy brown curls now. He might not cut it again. He wouldn't let Matron do it, he decided. It was better longer. Softer. He didn't want to look hard and mean any more. He didn't feel like he needed to. Smiling to himself, Remus drifted off to sleep. Fourth year, epilogue, some hours later. Remus dragged his trunk from the bus and down the long road to St. Edmund's all by himself. It was the first year Matron hadn't met him at King's Cross. She'd sent him his bus fare ahead of time and told him he was old enough now to make the journey alone. Perhaps she hoped he wouldn't come back at all. But where else would he go? He entered the cold grey building with a sense of resignation, signed himself in at the front desk and made his way to his dorm. It was a bright warm day, and he could hear most of the other boys shouting outside. He was hot and sticky, and hoping for a shower and a few quiet hours alone, in which he could unpack and maybe get started on his summer reading. But as he entered the dorm room, he found he was not entirely alone. 
there was a boy sitting on the bed adjacent to his. He must be new. Remus didn't recognise him from last year. He looked about fifteen or sixteen and wore a light blue vest top with orange piping and long flared denim jeans. His socks didn't match. His hair was blonde and curly, his face sunny and snub-nosed. He had a casual, friendly air. Oh, hello, Remus said quietly, dragging his trunk over to his bed. All right, the other boy greeted him. He had a chipped front tooth and a lopsided grin that made Remus want to smile back at him. His hair was longish and fell into his eyes. You're that kid what goes to fancy school all year, are you? Name's Grant. Remus nodded politely. Remus, nice to meet you. Blimey! Grant cracked an even wider smile. They said you was posh. Want me to bow to you, my lord? Remus returned a soft smile, unable to help himself. The other boy wasn't being rude or nasty. He forgot how much his accent had changed after four years at Hogwarts. Big reader, are you? Grant nodded to the books Remus was unpacking. I get a lot of homework, Remus said. Then he decided to relax for a bit. And yeah, I, I like reading. Cool, Grant replied. He lay back on the bed, arms behind his head, his long body stretched out, shirt rising up to expose the strip of skin just above his hips. Remus glanced at him sideways as he unpacked, trying not to look too much like he was looking. So, Grant was saying, what sort of music do you like? Chapter 72 Summer, 1975. Content warning for small mention of homophobic violence. Dear Mooney, I'm pretty sure I can get away with writing letters at least for now. I imagine they're being read, but I don't give a shit. Do you hear me, Regulus? Dreadful so far. Looks like Mum tried to take down my Gryffindor stuff while I was away, but I put it up with permanent sticking charms. I'm going to see if there's anything else I can put up to piss her off. There's a big family meeting next week. Posh dinner, dress robes, best behaviour, etc, etc. James thinks I should keep my head down and just make note of who attends and what gets said in case it's useful later. I don't know. Sort of want to set off some dung bombs instead. What would you do? Sirius. Sirius. Getting on with Reg, then. Go easy on him. You don't have anyone else on your side. Please be careful. I don't know what I'd do. I've never been to a posh dinner. Probably just make a twat of myself. Don't do anything stupid, okay? James is usually right. Remus. Dear Remus, Can't believe I have to spend the whole summer without any of you. Sometimes I really hate being an only child. I bet you're never lonely at St. Edmund's. Sirius seems okay. He checks in pretty often. I think he's bored. If boredom is the worst of it, then that's a good thing, right? I keep trying to convince him not to make a fuss. We don't know what sort of thing the blacks are involved in. Could be nothing at all. Hope your summer's off to a good start. Have you looked at the homework? The charms essay looks like a right ball ache. James. James. He'd be fine if he could control himself, but I doubt it. Keep talking to him. Remind him he's got to get back to Hogwarts in one piece. Summer's fine. You're right, I don't ever get lonely. I wouldn't mind a bit of privacy most of the time, but this summer's been good. Don't worry about me. That charms essay is a doddle and you know it. You just don't like hard work, Potter. Remus. Mooney. Greetings from San Francisco. I thought it would be hot here, but it's bloody freezing and rains most of the time. Merlin knows why Philomena would want to live here. It's no different than dear old Blighty. Pete. Dear Mooney. Caused an uproar this week. It was brilliant. Found a bunch of old muggle posters and a skip down the road. Pictures of girls. You know the sort. They don't even move. It's hilarious. Anyway, stuck them up on the walls with my patented sticking charm, and Mum is furious. I think she's probably only annoyed now because they're muggle girls. She couldn't care less that they've got their tits out. Anyway, now I can't go out unsupervised. Worth it, though. Sirius. Sirius. You're an idiot, and you know it. Posters? Don't you feel weird with all them staring at you? Remus. Dear Remus, really worried about Sirius. I don't know if he told you about the stunt he pulled with the posters, but he's a bloody idiot for doing it. Don't believe him if he says he's fine. He'd definitely been crying when I spoke to him last with the mirror. Don't tell him I told you that, obviously. 
Stand by in case we need to trigger the rescue mission. James. James, ready when you are. Remus. Mooney, don't listen to Potter. He's an old woman. Everything's fine. Nothing I can't cope with. Hope you're having a good summer. Can't wait for September. Sirius. Friday, 22nd of August, 1975. Remus staggered weakly into the dorm room. It had been a bad one. Madame Pomfrey thought it must be because of the change of scenery. He had a long, thick scar across his chest now. It had been ages since he'd got a scar. Grant sat up abruptly, looking hurt. Where you been? he asked. Thought you got arrested or something. Sick, Remus replied. Sick with what? Remus sighed, flopping down on his bed. It had been a hard night and he just wanted to sleep. He closed his eyes. He didn't feel like excuses today. Well, it was the full moon last night, you see, he said calmly. When I was five, I was bitten by a werewolf, and now I am one. I turn every month, and Matron locks me up so I don't hurt anyone else. Oh, ha ha, Grant replied, climbing onto Remus's bed, straddling him. They were both so skinny they fit easily together on the narrow bunk. Very funny, clever clogs. Fine, don't tell me. He leaned forward and kissed Remus. Remus opened his eyes, freezing for a moment. It's fine. Grant assured him, stroking his cheek. They're all outside. I checked. Remus kissed him back. It had been a strange sort of summer, but one of the most pleasant Remus had ever had. He hadn't been lonely for one. He hadn't counted down the days until the 1st of September. In the beginning, he and Grant had bonded over David Bowie, T-Rex and Neil Young, even Deep Purple, who Grant was crazy about and Remus thought Sirius would probably like. They both hated football and the other boys, so they sloped off together around town or sat behind the big empty port cabins, smoking stolen packs of fags. They'd just been sitting there on the hot gravel one day in mid-July, flicking stones and debating the finer points of Electric Warrior, when suddenly Grant's hand was on Remus's knee, then at his waist, pulling him closer. What are you? It's all right. Grant whispered, desperation edging his voice, pressing his forehead against Remus's hot cheek. No one's gonna find out. He tasted like cigarettes and sunburn. After that, whenever they were alone together, they were snogging. It was sort of a surprise, but mostly not. Remus quickly realised that he had always wanted it. This or something like it. Like a fog lifting. All things considered, he was grateful to Grant for having taken the initiative. It wasn't what you would call romantic or affectionate, more like a necessary thing, something Remus knew that he had to push as far as it could go so that he could identify all of the hard edges and sharp limits of it. He was mapping out his own desires and using Grant as a compass. His full name was Grant Chapman. He'd just turned 16 and had been at St. Edmund's since May, though it was by no means his first home. Both of Grant's parents were living and he even had some extended family, grandparents and aunts and uncles and grown-up cousins, but none of them seemed to want to keep him on for very long. Too much of a handful, Grant would grin cheekily. Everyone gets sick of me in the end. Like most of the boys at St. Edmund's, he did badly at school and had been in trouble with the police a few times on minor offences, though he'd never been officially arrested. He wasn't violent, but he had a mouth on him and a tendency to talk back, but there wasn't a threatening bone in his body. He was so clearly good all over. He had a spectacular smile. It creased his whole face and made you like him at once. One of his canine teeth was a bit wonky, and it was nothing short of endearing. Remus couldn't see why no one wanted him around. He was a bit silly sometimes. A bit immature, but that was okay. Remus knew he could be too serious a lot of the time. Something about Grant's chirpy, happy-go-lucky nature made Remus more confident and comfortable. And Grant just liked Remus so much really liked him. <laughs> You're the funniest bloke I ever met, Grant laughed when Remus hadn't said anything that amusing. Mind you, never copped off with anyone from a private school before. I'm no different than you, Remus replied. A care home job. Piss off, Grant shoved him playfully. You're going places. Anyone can see that. Remus didn't have a response to that, but it made him smile. Grant always made him smile. Besides all of these things, Grant was a really, really good kisser. At least Remus assumed as much, considering that Grant was the only person he'd ever kissed. 
The first time he felt a wild thrill as he thought to himself, So this is what all the fuss is about. He could snog Grant all day long without coming up for air. Sometimes he found himself compulsively pursing his lips in the night, hot with withdrawal pangs. Remus had expected kissing to be scary and awkward, but, as with so many things, Grant just put him at ease. He made it fun, right from the beginning. No fuss, no questions. If you're only here for the summer, then we might as well enjoy it, eh? He would say cheerfully. Don't worry, I ain't exactly about to propose, sweet as you are. Sweet? Remus scoffed. Sweet? Grant winked, and bloody too good for me by half. Remus hated that kind of talk and shut him up with another kiss. They had to hide most of the time, of course, from the other boys and from the staff. Remus couldn't imagine what would happen if they were ever found out. They'd be separated definitely, even if they weren't beaten to a pulp. Would Matron tell Dumbledore? Could they expel you for being a... Uh, well, for kissing other boys? Fortunately, Grant had some experience in covert operations, and they never even came close to being disturbed. How many times have you done this sort of thing? Remus got up the courage to ask one day. They were behind some disused bike sheds at the local secondary school. Few times, Grant shrugged. Not enough. You? Never, Remus replied, shocked. I didn't even... Oh, bless ya, Grant laughed lightly, tugging one of Remus's curls. You didn't know. Remus shook his head, his ears growing hot. Grant tutted. Never look at another bloke for too long? Never get that feeling about a film star? Or a teacher? Oh my god! Remus gasped, images of Farox crashing down on him. Grant laughed again. And I thought you were all at it with your boarding school lads. Remus just shook his head again in disbelief, wondering if there was something else he didn't know about himself. As summer approached, Remus found himself trying to ignore it. He felt guilty for not having spent the summer worrying about the war, for being distracted by his own selfish urges, especially at a time like this. But at the same time, he felt like he might never have this opportunity again. The other marauders sent letters, as they did every summer. Remus diligently wrote back, not wanting them to worry. He said nothing at all about Grant. He didn't know what to say, sure that if he put pen to paper it would all come spilling out and the other boys would never speak to him again. Or worse, they'd try to understand it without looking at him in the eye. That was part of it. On the other hand, Remus just liked the idea of keeping it to himself. The marauders didn't have to know everything about him, and he was allowed to have other friends, wasn't he? Chapter 73 Fifth Year Silver Monday, 1st of September, 1975 Remus shifted uncomfortably as he waited for a quiet moment to run at the ticket barrier. He was glad Matron hadn't come with him this year, glad to have had the time alone to prepare himself. Grant had wanted to come, but Matron said no and wouldn't give him the fare anyway. They managed a quick goodbye locked inside a bathroom at St. Edmund's, one of their many hiding places. Neither of them had said any of the things they'd wanted to say. Actually, they'd hardly spoken at all. But with minutes left, Remus promised he'd try to write. I'm crap at writing, Grant complained. Can't you give me your phone number? Uh, it's a really old-fashioned school. We don't get to use the phone much, Remus blagged. He thought there might be a phone box in Hogsmeade, or maybe the next village over, which was non-magical. He could try. Now, as he took aim at the grey ticket barrier and started forward, he had that usual sensation of leaving the Muggle world, and everyone in it, behind for another year. Grant did not exist on this side of the platform. Grant had never happened, and Remus was the same old Remus. Nothing has changed, he told himself. Nothing is different. Matron hadn't insisted he cut his hair this time, so he wasn't beginning the term looking like an oik. He was taller again. He wondered if he'd ever stop growing sometimes. But other than these silly superficial things, everything was as it had been, as it should be. No one would notice because there was nothing to notice, Remus told himself firmly. Nothing at all. He rubbed the back of his head absent-mindedly then, remembering Grant's fingers having been there only hours before, wiped his lips self-consciously. Shit. All right, you tosser! James slapped him on the back out of nowhere. 
James, really? Mrs. Potter chastised her son, standing beside him. She beamed up at Remus. Just look at you! You've grown inches! She pulled him into a hug. Still far too skinny for my liking. She began to straighten his clothes, peppering him with questions. Did he have something to eat for the journey? Had he come alone? Did he want any help getting his things aboard? By the end of this motherly assault, Remus was grinning from ear to ear, relaxed in the knowledge that everything was, indeed, fine. Nothing was different at all. He cheerfully boarded the train with James and Peter, chattering about their summers and their excitement for the year ahead. James had a silver pin on his chest emblazoned with a large C. Remus could smell it the second James came close, an irritating sting in his nostrils. He'd got his dearest wish, and was now Quidditch captain. They sat in their usual compartment, and Remus pulled his book from his bag, sitting in with a satisfied sigh. Then Sirius walked in, and Remus's stomach dropped through the floor. He was almost the same as ever. Height-wise, he'd nearly caught up with James now, and he was broader about the chest. His jaw had squared, and perhaps his nose had lengthened, but he had the same glossy black hair, the same arresting eyes and high cheekbones. He was still Sirius but he was somehow other, as if Remus was seeing them through new eyes. The heat of desire flared up in his chest out of nowhere, settling in his cheeks as a heavy blush. He looked away quickly before anyone noticed. Gentlemen, Sirius nodded graciously, entering the carriage like a prince. All right, the other two grinned and Remus mumbled. Sirius sat directly opposite Remus, his hair in uniform purposefully untidy, no doubt for the benefit of Walpurga Black, and flung out his legs as if he didn't expect them to be as long as they were. His ankle bumped against Remus's, and Remus shot up suddenly, sitting bolt upright and tucking his own gangly legs neatly under his seat. Sirius gave him a funny look, then a smirking grin which caused a sharp tug behind Remus's navel. Oh, God, he thought. No, no, no. Half expected you not to be here, James said relieved. Couldn't have the black air not turning up for his first day of school. Sirius rolled his dark blue eyes, raising an artful eyebrow. Couldn't have the whole wizarding world knowing that there's strife in my noble family. How are you? James asked earnestly. Did they... How are you? Fine, Sirius nodded a bit stiffly. Don't want to talk about it now. Can we just pretend it's a normal first day? Yeah, all right, mate, James nodded unconvincingly. Pete was just telling us about California. We didn't manage to find Phil, Peter said. Her housemate said she'd moved on, everywhere we looked. Mum was, well, she was really upset. It was crap. Remus felt a stab of guilt. It was so long ago now, but he'd once told Philomena she could just run away if she wanted. No one says you have to use magic. After his own blissfully simple magic-free summer... Remus was starting to envy Peter's sister. The train had pulled out of the station and the grey London buildings were whooshing by, soon to give way to the lush green fields of the home counties. How was your summer, Mooney? James asked suddenly, and Remus realised Peter had stopped talking some time ago. Yeah, fine. Remus had practised this in his head on his way to King's Cross, but he hadn't counted on Sirius looking so... It was difficult to stay focused. Usual, nothing exciting. Um, football, homework, uh, yeah, fine. Not great, but well, fine, yeah, uh, not bad. Fine. Thankfully, the door to their carriage slid open, putting a stop to his blabbering. Lily Evans stood in the doorway, beaming with delight, her hair a fiery halo. Evans! James boomed eagerly. You found me! As if it's hard, Potter. Lily rolled her eyes. You lot are always in the same car. Anyway, I'm not here for you. I'm here for you, she pointed at Remus, still grinning. Me? Remus frowned, confused for a moment, then it dawned on him. He sighed heavily, wanting to sink into his chair and disappear. The other three marauders and Lily were all staring at him with varying expressions, all expectant. You got it, didn't you? She said impatiently. Come on, we have to go for a meeting in the... Merlin! Sirius suddenly exclaimed, slapping his forehead comically. How did we forget? Mooney, are you a... A prefect, James yelled. Remus hung his head. Yeah. 
And you didn't tell us immediately so we could rip the piss out of you? Sirius's face had lit up, some of the old eleven-year-old mischief-maker showing through. You're just jealous, Lily said haughtily. Come on, Remus, where's your badge? The badge? Sirius burst out laughing. I forgot about the badge. Oh, please, Mooney, show us the badge. Peter and James's shoulders were shaking too, and Remus shook his head, trying to look disapproving. It's in my trunk. Well, put it on, Lily said. Come on, we have our own carriage and everything. Hey, Evans, I'm Quidditch captain, you know. Yes, Marlene said, Lily said, without so much as glancing at James's direction. Come on, Remus! Uh, okay, but the badge is in the bottom of the trunk. I'll wear it tomorrow, Remus said, getting up. Oh, no, we can look for it if you want. No, I can't be bothered, Remus shrugged, not looking at her. Oh, go on, Sirius wheedled, getting up and reaching for Remus's trunk. We want to see you in your nice, shiny... Badge. No! Remus snapped, glaring at Sirius. Thank goodness it was still easy to get annoyed with him. He raised his eyebrows so Lily couldn't see and said very pointedly, Silver isn't my colour. Sirius's eyes widened immediately in realisation. Remus raised his eyebrows and followed Lily out. He glanced back through the glass door just in time to see James quickly removing his own pin. Being a prefect was as bad as Remus had expected. The letter had come as much as a surprise to him as to everyone else. The pin fell out of his usual Hogwarts reading list and onto his lap one summer morning. He'd hissed with pain as the silver burned his fingers and dropped it on the floor. Grant picked it up. What the bloody hell is this? I'm a prefect, Remus said, not believing it himself. A, a what? Jesus, sometimes I think I've made you up. You don't know the half of it, Remus had groaned. My friends are never going to let me live this down. Ah, good! Grant stuck out his pink tongue. Remus just shook his head again and resolved to write a letter to Dumbledore about this, demanding that someone else be given the job. James would be good. Even Peter would be better than Remus. Dumbledore had not responded. He tried McGonagall, who did respond, simply saying that the decision was final. Remus decided to try once again when the term started. On the train, Lily and James had to attend an extremely tiresome meeting with all of the other prefects, led by the interminably boring head boy and girl. After that, they were expected to patrol the corridors, stopping anyone from having any fun. Unfortunately, Lily took this duty very seriously, and Remus got the feeling it was going to be a very long year. Still, it was much preferable to sitting in a confined space with Sirius. He would have to do his best to steer clear for a while, until he worked out this latest revelation. The feast was okay. It felt less merry than previous years. Remus didn't know if that was his own turmoil or the pallor of the war. There were less students than usual, only a handful of first years. No one was mentioning it. After dinner, Lily made Remus patrol again, and he actually didn't mind. He hoped that if he could stay away long enough, the others would be in bed, then he wouldn't have to see them until lessons the next morning, if James and Sirius left early for Quidditch practice. You're still not wearing your pin, Lily said as they walked the length of the fourth floor hall. Yeah, sorry, Remus yawned. I'll find it tomorrow, I promise. So, how was summer? Yeah, great. Remus grinned wider than he meant to. Lily smiled back at him, looking genuinely pleased. Oh, that's lovely. What did you do? Uh, nothing. Loads of homework. Weirdo, Lily elbowed him, laughing. Even I don't like homework that much. He was right. By the time he got back to the common room, everyone had gone to bed, and the marauder's bedroom was dark and quiet. He padded quietly into the bathroom, brushed his teeth, and pulled out his pyjamas, then crept over to his bed, drawing the curtains tight. It felt as though he'd only just relaxed properly when he heard Sirius get out of bed. He knew each of his roommates by their footsteps now. He used to like knowing it. Now it felt like a peculiar kind of torture, as Sirius drew closer and hissed, Mooney! Psst! Oi, even you don't fall asleep that easily. Remus groaned, crawled to the edge of the bed and opened the curtains. What? Come on, why are you avoiding us? Is it the prefect thing? You know we're just teasing. Lighten up. Here, I've got something for you. He opened his hand. In the dark, Remus leaned over and saw his red and silver prefect pin. He frowned. Is this a joke? No, take it. Trust me, Remus. 
Sirius caught his eye and Remus's mind went completely blank. He accepted the pin, waited, and... felt nothing. He blinked and looked down. What? Transfigured it! Sirius smiled, looking thrilled. His teeth gleamed in the dark. It's tin now! Did the same to James's. I reckon I can get Mary to pinch Evans's too, and I'll do that. You'll be spending loads of time with her, so might as well. Thank you. Don't be silly! Sirius shook his head, still smiling, eyes soft. Anything for you, Mooney. Good night. He turned and crept back to his own bed. Remus fell back onto his pillows, exhaling heavily, still clutching the pin so tight it bit into his palm. He flung the covers over his head and willed his heart to stop pounding. Oh, God, he thought grimly. I fancy Sirius Black. Chapter 74, Fifth Year, Pain. Content warning, dark themes and domestic abuse. Remus overslept the next morning and would have missed breakfast if Peter hadn't shouted his name about a hundred times before leaving himself. As the door slammed, Remus rolled onto his back and stared at a chink of light coming through his curtains. He'd slept badly and resigned himself to sleeping badly every night until he got this ridiculous serious thing out of his system. The first thing to do was to stop thinking about it, he told himself sternly, jumping out of bed and heading straight for the shower, cold as he could stand it. James and Sirius must have left early for Quidditch. A memory of Sirius in his scarlet robes surfaced, his hair pulled back, face glistening, that energetic, competitive glint in his eyes. Remus groaned and turned the shower knob all the way from lukewarm to icy. He forced himself to think about something else. Charms or arithmancy or history. Yes, he found that listing off the names of the generals involved in each side of the Great Goblin Revolt of 1642 seemed to calm him down a bit. Gave him something to focus on, anyway. You couldn't have lustful thoughts with names like Krebshunk and Fripp the Disemboweler running through your head. He dressed and headed down for breakfast. Their first lesson was transfiguration, and you could never get away with being late for McGonagall. In the Great Hall, Peter was sitting at the Ravenclaw table with Desdemona, and they were clearly getting reacquainted after a long summer apart. Remus sighed a little inwardly, remembering how that felt. It was even worse to watch other couples snogging when you knew what you were missing. Sirius and James were at the Gryffindor table, both dressed in their school uniforms, but decidedly rumpled from practice. Their body language was very out of character. Sirius was turned away from James, nose in the air, James looking furtive and wound up. If Remus didn't know better, he'd have thought they were in the middle of a row. As he sat down opposite his friends, he found that this first impression had been correct. They were sitting in stony silence, and it was clear that Sirius was being very stubborn about something. Morning, Remus said, tentatively reaching for some toast and jam. Morning, your prefectness. Sirius replied with half a smile. He was pouring spoonful after spoonful of brown sugar into his porridge. Hiya, Mooney, James said, glancing over at him briefly before turning back to Sirius. He looked worn out, stressed. It didn't suit him. Sirius, he said very seriously. Sirius ignored him. Sirius, James repeated louder. Not now, Potter, I'm busy. You're playing with your breakfast. James wrinkled his nose. And please don't eat that. My teeth hurt just looking at it. Remus thought it looked good, actually. He liked very sweet things, especially when he was in a bad mood. He kept this opinion to himself. Best not to get involved when James and Sirius were concerned. Sirius finished pouring his last teaspoon of sugar, stirred it vigorously until the mixture had turned the texture and colour of sand. He scooped up a heaped spoonful then, making eye contact with James the whole time, shoved it in his mouth and chewed. Remus could hear the grains of sugar crunching between his teeth. James shook his head. You don't have to be like that. I'm not regulus, he said grumpily. Sirius scowled at him, then stood up. Gotta go to the library, he said, his mouth still full of oversweet porridge. S <clears throat> See you in Transfiguration. James sighed heavily, watching Sirius leave. Remus breathed a small sigh of relief, but felt immediately guilty about it. There was obviously something wrong with his friend, and he ought to be just as concerned as James. What's up? 
he asked, hoping he could sound calm and caring. You see him limping, James said, still watching Sirius walk out of the hall. Remus looked. He had the same arrogant swagger as usual, his hair swishing and his shoulders back, but... Yes, Remus thought James was right. He looked a bit unsteady at his feet. Something happened at practice? Remus frowned. No, James shook his head. Been like that since yesterday. Remus thought back, scanning his memories. Sirius had been sitting down most of the time Remus had seen him, and even then, Remus hadn't exactly been looking in great detail. In fact, he'd been trying to do the opposite. His guilt took on a new dimension. You think his mum did something? He asked, his stomach churning. I know she did, James replied fiercely. He was looking at the Slytherin table now. He tried to hide it in the changing rooms, but I caught him in the showers, and... Merlin, Mooney, if you saw... What? James shook his head as if he wished he could shake out the image. She's butchered him. A chill ran through Remus that was ten times more effective than a cold shower. All of a sudden he was eleven again and back in the Quidditch changing room after he and Sirius had crashed their brooms. Eleven-year-old Sirius whispered, I've got scars, and lifted his trouser leg to show the long, straight silver marks. At the time, Remus had only thought how different they were than his own scars, how neat in uniform, as if they'd been done with a razor blade. Later, Sirius had described the scars as a discipline technique, but they'd never discussed it again. Is he okay? Remus asked shakily, no longer wanting his toast. He says he is, James replied, but he won't... he won't talk about it or say anything. I shouldn't have brought up Regulus like that. He's just so bloody stubborn. What can we do? Remus worried. He can't go back there. It's not right. Can your family do something? They tried last summer, James said sadly. But no joy. If I can get him to go to someone, Dumbledore or even Madame Pomfrey, if they could see what that old bitch does, maybe we could get him out. He won't, though, Remus sighed. Sirius would never show weakness like that. Can you try, Mooney? James asked desperately. He won't talk to me, but sometimes you can sort of shock him into it. Me? Yeah, you know, I think he listens to you sometimes. He always wants to impress you. Oh, why did James have to say a thing like that? They went to Transfiguration and found Sirius already there, studiously ignoring them. It was the same story for the rest of the day. Even at lunchtime, Sirius engaged Mary and Marlene in conversation before James or Remus could get a word in. He kept them entertained with silly impressions of Peter and Desdemona so that they were hysterical with laughter. James sat by, grim-faced, his expression not flickering once. They weren't able to trap Sirius alone until well after dinner. Peter was once again conspicuously absent, and Remus found that he and Lily were off the rota for patrol that evening. They caught Sirius exiting the bathroom, and James stood in front of the door so he couldn't escape to the common room. Remus decided to go for the direct approach. Heard you had a shit summer, he said, looking at Sirius in the eye. It was easier if you're ready for it. Sirius snorted. What's James been saying? That you're hurt, but you're too much of a stuck-up git to admit it. I'm not hurt, Sirius growled, disgusted. It's healing. This morning you were bleeding, James said angrily, clearly at his wit's end. What? Remus said, alarmed. God, serious, you've got to go to Madame Pomfrey. And have the whole school know how my mother likes to amuse herself? No, thanks. Yes, because Madame Pomfrey tells the whole school everything, Remus said, raising a sarcastic eyebrow. Let me see. No, Godric, you're worse than Potter. Come on, I've shown you mine. Remus caught his eye again and held it. He saw Sirius calculating, weighing up the benefits, then slowly relenting. I don't want James to see, he said, looking down, embarrassed. Remus turned and looked at James, whose shoulders slumped a bit with disappointment. Still, stoic as ever, he nodded and promptly left the room. Remus felt very vulnerable now, being alone with Sirius. He pushed all selfish thoughts aside and tried to concentrate on helping his best friend. Come on, then, he nodded at Sirius. Let's see, one victim to another. He'd meant that as a bit of a dark joke, but realised it once had been the wrong thing to say. He cursed himself and resolved to shut up unless he had something helpful to say. 
Sirius sat on the nearest bed, which happened to be Remus's, and pulled up his trouser leg. Remus had to hold back a gasp of horror. James had used exactly the right word. Butchered. The marks were not neat and ordered as the earlier scars had been. These were vicious, crisscrossed, varying in depth of severity. The entire backs of his calves looked as though someone had sliced at them with a surgeon's scalpel. Lacero, Remus asked, trying to keep his face blank. Sirius flinched slightly at the word, but nodded. Bitch, Remus said. Sirius laughed. Goes all the way up, he said. Shit, Remus breathed. He backed away, then went to his bedside table to rummage round. I've got something that'll stop it hurting. It doesn't... Don't lie, Remus commanded, pulling out his jar of Mertlap essence. I know pain. Sirius accepted this. Remus returned and handed him the jar. Sirius looked at it, then at Remus expectantly. You rub it on, Remus said. He shook the jar impatiently. Come on, I'm not doing it for you. I'm not your house elf. He thought he'd been doing pretty well, but it would all come crumbling down if he had to touch Sirius, even somewhere as innocent as his calves. Sirius grinned and took the Mertlap essence. He scooped out a liberal dollop with his long fingers and smeared some onto his leg. Remus saw from the look on his face that it had worked at once. His features relaxed. Some of the sharpness left his eyes. He must have really been in pain. Bloody hell, you're amazing, Mooney, Sirius said, cheering up as he continued to apply the essence. Remus blushed and shrugged. It's just magic. Not like I discovered the stuff. Yeah, but still... Sirius stood up now and began to unbutton his trousers so that he could do the rest of the cuts. Remus practically leapt back and scrambled toward the door, babbling. I, oh, I'll give you some privacy. Got to go anyway. Homework! His voice was much higher than he wanted it to be. He practically ran down the stairs and bumped straight into James. Is he okay? Yeah, yeah, I gave him something for it. Just give him a minute. I think he'll come down. Brilliant. Thanks, Remus. I didn't talk to him about going to a teacher or anyone. Yeah, but he's talking to us now, James beamed. Seriously, thanks, Mooney. You're a legend. We're going to pay you back. I'm not supposed to say anything about it yet, but, well, I promise we're going to. With that, James clapped him on the shoulder, then ran up the stairs to see Sirius. Remus sank into a nearby armchair and decided to reassess a few things. He had to get away, in case they came back down. He left the common room and went to the library, where he spent the rest of the evening painstakingly studying the Goblin Rebellions. It was OWLs this year, after all, and he couldn't allow his libido to wreck everything he'd been working for. It was almost curfew by the time he felt ready to leave. His eyes twitched and his back ached, and he was in a bad mood, but at least he wasn't thinking about Sirius anymore. Well, not really. He left the library and walked quickly up the dark corridors to Gryffindor Tower, he was at least halfway there when he heard an odd sort of noise, like a whimper, at the end of the charms hallway. Sighing to himself, he went to investigate. Lily would have had his guts for guarders if he didn't. It was as he suspected. Two Slytherins had cornered a Ravenclaw first year and were tormenting him. They held him in a binding curse. Remus had been in that position multiple times. Expelliarmus, he called out, and the two Slytherins' wands flew into his hands. They turned, one dark-haired and one fair, Barty Crouch and Regulus Black. Oh, you two, Remus yawned, leaning casually against the wall. The Ravenclaw scurried off, squeaking a quick, Thank you, to Remus as he did so. Looney Lupin! Barty smirked. He had a horrible smile, as if he'd never really known joy or happiness. Watch your tongue, Crouch! Remus hissed, then shot a curse at him. At once, Barty's tongue began to swell up, turning purple as it did so. He clutched at it desperately, but it was one of James's engorgement charms and could not be stopped. Better get to the hospital wing, Remus smiled pleasantly. I'll send your wands up to your head of house. Let him know you are out of bounds. How dare you, Regulus seethed, marching over to Remus. He was much shorter. Almost the same height as Sirius, but it didn't stop him squaring up to the fifth year. The summer had clearly treated Regulus poorly, too. He was paler than ever, his eyes dark and hollow. 
filthy half-blood scum. You might be a prefect, but you're still just a cowardly, dirty... Cowardly, am I? Remus saw red and dropped both wands, instead using his hands to ram Regulus up against the wall by his neck. The younger boy's head hit the brick wall, and he blinked, genuine terror showing on his face. Remus didn't care. In fact, it was perfect. I may be a half-blood, Remus hissed menacingly. But at least I don't stand by and watch my family get cut to shreds. Regulus's eyes widened and a terrible, haunted look came over him. I told him to stop pushing her, but he wouldn't listen, he whispered. I couldn't stop her. Disgusted, Remus let go. Barty was still choking further down the hall. You're a coward, Regulus Black, Remus said, very quietly. Don't ever forget it. He spat at Regulus's feet and walked away. Chapter 75 Fifth Year The Surprise So inviting, so enticing to play the part, I could play the wild mutation as a rock and roll star. I could do with the money, you know that I could. I'm so wiped out with things as they are, you know that I should. I'll send my photograph to my honey and become like a regular superstar. Saturday, 20th of September, 1975 over the next three weeks, Remus managed to fall into a somewhat more comfortable routine as he learnt to navigate his newfound feelings. Once upon a time, he might have simply tried to avoid Sirius, to withdraw and hide in the library or one of his little corners, but he'd learnt that this never worked in the end, especially when you shared a bedroom. And at any rate, he was far too big for most of his old cubby holes now. So he simply tried to cope, and in trying he found that he could. Not that it was easy, exactly, but he had so much else to worry about. On top of prefect duties, which usually held Remus up and down the castle, for patrol duties and meetings, it was an important year for their studies. With OWLs coming up, the teachers were loading them up with more work than ever, and there'd been a noticeable shift in the syllabus. In Transfiguration, they were learning concealment. In Charms, they practiced disarming. Potions was largely focusing on identifying and counteracting poisons, and defense against the dark arts seemed to be nothing but drill after drill of attack and defense spells. They were training for war, and everyone knew it. Care of Magical Creatures was a grim affair. Professor Kettleburn was a grumpy, barking old man with half his limbs missing in an eye patch. He didn't bring anything in for them to look at, or tell them stories of his encounters with fantastic beasts, he preferred to recount how he got all his various injuries, and it was always horrible. Remus tried to spin this in a positive way. At least without Ferox, there was one less distraction. There was no way he was going to develop a crush on crusty old Kettleburn. Sirius was quite enough to contend with. Though he managed to simply smile through his feelings most of the time, they seemed to surface at the most inopportune moments. He'd be reading a book, and there it was or completely alone in the library and a memory would pop up, stirring up his insides. It left him often shaken, too hot, and confused. If this had been how James and Mary and Marlene and Peter and everyone else involved in the stupid snogging business had been feeling for the past two years, then Remus simply didn't know how any of them had gotten anything done. It seemed his mind and body were constantly at war. He wasn't stupid. He knew he was something of a late bloomer where that sort of thing had been concerned, the summer after he'd turned thirteen, Matron had called him into her office and asked him in the vaguest terms possible how much he knew about marital relations. He wasn't very sure how much he ought to know, and didn't want to look stupid, so he just said he knew everything. She nodded and told him to ask a male member of staff if he had any questions. Of course, he never had. They also once had a talk from the local vicar about the sanctity of marriage and the sinful nature of acting on base urges, but Remus had been so mortified he'd blocked most of that out. Base urges. It wasn't something you were supposed to talk about seriously, at least not with other boys. He knew that much. Jokes were okay, at least you were in safe territory if you just teased each other, but you certainly couldn't ask questions. The other marauders were ahead of him. Some nights, close to the full moon, he caught the scent of their lust, and heard their quiet, aching moments of frustration and shame as they fumbled under the bedsheets in the dark. It just embarrassed him. Of course, Remus did. Of course, he had. 
but that just felt like maintenance, with no meaning assigned to it other than brushing his teeth. Ever since the past summer, though, things in that department had changed, become more urgent, as if snogging Grant had activated him in some way, unleashed a great flood of... feelings. Remus rarely thought about anything else, he was constantly on edge. For once, he was grateful for the billowing black robes they were required to wear at Hogwarts, but even though he often found himself having to stay seated longer than everyone else sometimes, trying to think neutral thoughts, once he'd had to cover his lap with a particularly heavy book, simply because McConaughey had said wand work too many times. He felt changed on the inside. It was present in every moment, whether he was alone or in company. And serious. Why did it have to be serious? Okay, he knew why. It was the way his thin white school shirt hung off his back, the way his hair fell in his eyes so that he had to push it back, even though he never, ever tucked it behind his ears. His hands. His fucking eyes. It had been a very trying three weeks. Remus was grateful that this first full moon of the term had fallen on a weekend. It meant that he could sleep in and lounge around peacefully waiting for nightfall, rather than sitting through hours of lessons, bones aching on hard wooden seats. Saturday was also Quidditch practice day. Actually, ever since Jane became Quidditch captain, practice was almost every day, leaving Remus completely, blissfully undisturbed. He'd slept in most of the morning, then wandered downstairs for lunch, before returning to the quiet of an empty bedroom. He read his book for a while, but feeling headachy and restless, soon gave up. He wished the moon would hurry up and come so he could get it over with. Waiting for it was the worst part. He closed his eyes, stretching out, then decided he was sick of lying down. He climbed off his bed and went to sit on the window sill with a packet of cigarettes, the last he had for the summer, given to him by Grant as a leaving gift. Grant. If Grant were here at Hogwarts, would Remus himself feel the same about Sirius? Probably, he sighed to himself. And Grant was so canny at that sort of thing he'd work it out right away. Maybe he'd have some advice. If only he could call him, or even write a letter. But he was only allowed to send owls to Matron. And what if she read it? Remus wished he had the compact mirrors James and Sirius had. Though how on earth he would explain them to Grant, he had no idea. He finished his first cigarette and started on another. It was soothing. Weed was better. He'd had some after his last full moon, but he hadn't seen anyone at Hogwarts smoking it. He was on the outs with the smoking set anyway, as he was no longer supplying. The past summer's distractions had cost him in more ways than one. Evening was drawing in and Remus's stomach began to rumble. He tried to eat light on full moons, anticipating the pain which sometimes made him sick. In the days afterwards, he would be ravenous and could easily manage three or four plates a meal. He was just about to get up and go down when the door opened. Peter, James, and Sirius walked in with curious looks on their faces. James looked very serious and quite cautious, as if he had to deliver some news and wasn't sure how Remus would take it. Remus knew it couldn't be bad news, though, because Sirius was grinning from ear to ear, showing every one of his perfect pearly white teeth. Peter was wringing his hands as usual, but he too had a small, wicked smile, the look he always had when they were in the middle of a particularly devious prank. Oh God, Remus said before James could speak. What now? Why aren't you at Quidditch? No Quidditch today, Sirius said, still grinning like a maniac. The energy coming off him was electric, burning hot. He was clearly extremely excited about something. Where have you been then? Remus asked, choosing to look at James instead to keep his voice level. We've been practicing something else, Peter burst out, biting his bottom lip. Remus leaned back on the window sill and looked at James again, raising a questioning eyebrow. James swallowed, his Adam's apple bobbing, then cleared his throat. Mooney, he said. You may remember we had an idea in third year. You have ideas all the time, Potter. Be specific, he said irritably, lighting his third cigarette. His shoulders hurt and his neck. He wasn't in the mood for games on a full moon, and they should know this by now. Two... To help you with the... I know you said we shouldn't, um... James ran his hands through his hair. But we'd already got so far with it, and, um... Look, I'm sorry. We're sorry. But... Spit it out! Remus hide, exhaling smoke. James looked panicked. 
He glanced at Sirius, then looked at his feet and mumbled, We've become Animagus. What? Oh, for Merlin's sake, Sirius said, stepping forward. Look, Remus. And with that, Sirius promptly transformed into a very large black dog, and Remus fell off the window ledge in shock. Chapter 76 Fifth Year, Mooney and Co. The Dog Sirius the Dog Barked twice and wagged its tail playfully as Remus picked himself up off the floor. He looked at James and Peter, who were both smiling sheepishly. He looked at a dog again, and it transformed back into Sirius, standing before him with the same mad grin. You did it, Remus said tonelessly. I can't believe you bloody did it. He sat down again, feeling a bit wobbly. Are you angry with us? James asked, his eyes huge and earnest. Can you all do it? Peter and James looked at each other, then nodded. Remus breathed in, his chest tight. Go on, then, he whispered. Show me. At once, James and Peter transformed into a huge regal stag and a fat brown rat. James's antlers scraped the low ceiling of their room, so he had to bow his head slightly. Sirius laughed. We couldn't choose what we turned into, he explained. Otherwise, Pete would have probably picked something else. Oi, Peter said, transforming back. Rats are highly intelligent creatures. I looked it up. Shame you're not, Sirius replied. Not everyone wants to be a big slobbering mutt. James transformed back too and punched Sirius on the shoulder. All right, Bambi, calm down, Sirius smirked, ruffling Peter's hair. Just having a laugh, aren't we, mate? Peter smiled back. He did look pretty happy. All of them did. Remus was still speechless. He watched them all as if they were strangers. Had they really done this? Some of the most difficult magic, which required skill, concentration, and above all, patience. Just for him. Remus, James asked, looking serious again. You aren't angry, are you? I... Remus frowned, then shook his head. No, no, not, not angry, I just... He rubbed the back of his head, closing his eyes. I knew you'd do it anyway. I knew you'd try, at least. He never listened to me. We're sorry, James said, forlorn. Even Sirius had stopped bouncing about. Don't be sorry, Remus said, quickly opening his eyes. What you've done is amazing. You lot are amazing. I just... I don't know what to say. He cursed himself for not being able to thank them properly for feeling everything so strongly, but being unable to put it into any words. What was the point of all that reading if it didn't give you the words when you needed them? He looked up again to find Sirius watching him. His smile was calmer now, and the light of understanding shone in his eyes. Remus's heart skipped a beat. Thank you, he said quietly, just to Sirius. Anything for you, Mooney? Sirius grinned again, and suddenly everything was back to normal and the dorm room was just their dorm room, and these incredible people were just his friends. Come on, Sirius said, brightly, addressing all of them. Let's go down for dinner. We've got a long night ahead of us. Tonight? Remus said, surprised. You want to try it tonight? Of course, he thought. This is why they chose this very last moment to reveal themselves. No time like the present, James smiled. You want to spend another night alone in that horrid shack when you don't have to, Remus, Peter said earnestly. Remus thought about this as he followed the others down the many stairs and corridors to the Great Hall. He did not like being alone, right before the moon or after it. He assumed the wolf didn't like being alone either, judging by the pain it caused him. But he always had done it alone. It had never been a question before. He didn't speak at all through dinner, picking at his plate listlessly. Sirius nudged him every now and then, and Remus threw him a smile, but went back to playing with his roast potatoes. "'Remus, you're not eating,' Marlene said, concerned. "'That's really not like you.' Hmm, he replied, putting his fork down. "'I don't feel well. I think I'll go to the hospital wing.' "'Oh, no, again?' Marlene tilted her head in sympathy. "'You poor thing.' 
Remus shrugged and got up to leave. The marauders got up too and followed him out. How are you going to do it? he asked as he walked, not daring to look at any of them. Pete's small, he can get us in, James said eagerly. Then we'll use the cloak. It's a doddle to fit under, now we can change. Okay, Remus nodded, working it out. Okay, if you can sneak in behind Pomfrey. She puts a locking charm on the door otherwise. Great, Peter nodded enthusiastically. We'll do it, Remus, we will. Outside the hospital wing, he turned and looked at them all. It helped to be tall at times like this. You know, I might kill you all. They looked back at him without wavering. Sirius straightened his back. You won't, Remus sighed. Okay, see you in an hour or so then. And with that, he entered the infirmary without looking back. His heart was hammering in his chest, part excitement, part terror. It was dangerous, so, so dangerous that his head hurt. But he'd told them no once before, and this was the result. He could only hope they were quick enough and clever enough to escape if things went wrong. And if they couldn't escape, he hoped that at least one of them would be brave enough to do what was necessary to ensure the three of them survived, even if it meant he wouldn't. You all right, dear? Madame Pomfrey asked, surveying him with worried eyes. I know the first night is a bad one. It's okay, really, Remus said, sitting down on his little cot, as usual. Don't worry about me, I'll see you in the morning. The very crack of dawn, the many witch promised. She gave him a quick kiss on the forehead before bustling out of the room. Remus breathed in deeply and looked round. Are you there? He breathed into the empty room. James appeared suddenly, pulling back the cloak. Sirius and Peter quickly followed, transforming back from their animagus forms. I don't think I'll ever get used to that, Remus blinked. He bit his lip nervously and tried to smile, gesturing at the dingy room. Welcome to the Shrieking Shack. Mooney, James said, looking deeply troubled as he took in the surroundings. It's horrible. It's okay. It's better than a cage. It is a cage, Sirius said, sounding fierce. When will it happen? Peter asked, suddenly standing between the two. Remus rolled his shoulders carefully to see how the ache was coming along. Not long, he said flatly. Fifteen minutes, maybe. They were quiet for a bit. When Remus could feel his blood begin to boil and that tell-tale tingling in his muscles, he suddenly panicked. No one's ever seen it before, he said, staring at them helplessly. I don't think... it's really, really ugly. It's okay, James said soothingly. We know what to expect. I might scream. I will scream. It's fine, Sirius promised. You've got your wands? Yep. They all withdrew them to show him. Good. He nodded, looking at the floorboards. His back hurt. He could feel every vertebra pushing against his skin. If I attack, if you can't control me, you're going to have to... He faltered. It was starting. Change! he shouted, curling up on the bed, facing the wall. Quickly! His nerve endings caught fire and the transformation began. It hurts, his mind babbled like a whinging child. It hurts, it hurts, it hurts. He started to lose his mind in the agony, aware someone was screaming until he wasn't Remus anymore, and the screaming was a long, dark howl of anguish. He finally rolled over, his body new and strong and powerful. He sniffed. He knew this place, his prison. He wanted to be free. He wanted to get out and run and hunt and kill. He was so hungry, so restless. He was about to howl again, run at the windows or scratch at the door. He sniffed the air. He was not alone. The wolf turned its eyes on the three animals locked in with it. It growled, jumped down from the bed. It snapped his jaws and stood tall, raising its tail to show dominance. The black one growled too, sniffing at the wolf. It stepped forward and the wolf snarled, still unsure. The black one lay down at the wolf's feet. It rolled over and showed its belly. Friend. The wolf, knowing itself to be the leader now, stopped growling. He recognized the scent of them, knew they meant no harm. This was his pack, and he was no longer alone. 
Remus woke up choking and spluttering as he came back into his body. It was dark and dusty like always, and his bones were still sore and tired, and his head still throbbed. But there was no blood. At least he couldn't smell it, couldn't taste it, and the pain was passing quickly, like water down a drain. Mooney? Sirius's voice broke in, familiar and comforting. Here. Remus felt hot with shame as Sirius handed him a blanket to cover himself. Thanks, he croaked, wrapping it round himself. He squinted as his vision unblurred, the shapes of his three friends swimming slowly into view. Everyone okay? Fine, Sirius beamed. Better than fine. It worked, Mooney. Here, come on. James reached down and helped Remus to his feet, then supported him back over to the little bed. Remus still felt weak as usual, but that was all. No cuts, no scratches. He'd not hurt himself at all. He pulled his blanket tight around his body and looked up at his three best friends, the dearest people in the world. His eyes filled with tears and he looked down, quickly, embarrassed. Are you okay? Sirius asked, sounding worried. Does it still hurt? No, Remus shook his head, smiling. I'm just being silly. He wiped his eyes and looked at them again. James looked as regal and proud as ever, his glasses slightly askew, dark rings under his eyes, but smiling nonetheless. Peter was pink, flushed with excitement, and Sirius was utterly perfect, glowing as if he'd just been handed the Quidditch cup. Remus felt very frail and pathetic, all skinny and naked on the bed beside these heroes. Was it bad? he asked nervously. The transformation? It was pretty awful, James said honestly. The others nodded. You're so brave, Remus, Peter burst out. But afterwards it was... Sirius said, eager to remember. Afterwards it was amazing. You weren't sure at first, but then I... You submitted to me, Remus said. I remember. I thought you couldn't remember anything that happened, James asked, cocking his head. I can't, usually, Remus frowned. But last night was different. I remember it all. It wasn't me, exactly. But I wasn't not me, either. Does that make sense? No, Sirius laughed. Remus laughed, too. You lot better get under the cloak. Madame Pomfrey's on her way. Could, er... Uh... Someone hand me my clothes. Sirius was the last to hide under the cloak. He was alive with joy and kept transforming back and forth, unable to stay still. When they absolutely had to go, he squeezed Remus's shoulder gently one last time. Didn't I tell you, Mooney? Didn't I tell you? He whispered feverishly. You did, Remus smiled weakly. He lowered his voice so that no one else could hear him and looked at Sirius carefully. Was it scary? Was I scary? He had no idea what he looked like in wolf form. Sirius' expression did not flicker. No, he said firmly. You were beautiful. Chapter 77 Fifth Year Content Warning for Brief Mention of Homophobic Violence of course, Madame Pomfrey was completely confounded by Remus's blemish-free night in the shack. Amazing, she kept repeating. Completely amazing. Remus fobbed her off with some mad theory that he was maturing and that must account for it. She didn't seem convinced, but the sweet nurse was just so pleased to find him unharmed she didn't ask any questions about it. She kept him in the infirmary to sleep through Sunday, but by midday he was felt as alert and energetic as he did when the moon was waning. I've got no reason to keep you here, Madame Pomfrey smiled, not quite believing it. I don't believe in cluttering up my ward with healthy patients. Remus practically skipped back to Gryffindor Tower, taking the stairs two at a time. He was unsurprised to find the marauders all in bed still, though James and Peter were showing signs of life. All right, Mooney, James smiled sleepily, pulling back his bed curtains at the sound of the dormitory door. All right. Remus whispered back, not wanting to wake Sirius. He hated having his sleep interrupted at the best of times, and today Remus felt he deserved a lie-in. Plus, 
you were beautiful had been ringing in Remus's ears all day, and he wasn't sure how he would ever be able to speak to Sirius again. Pomfrey say anything? Nah, she can't work out what she did differently. We got away with it. Great, James yawned. We'll have to get some pepper up pills or something next time. It's a Monday. You don't have to do it every month. Shut up, Mooney, Peter called out groggily. We'll do whatever we like. Remus smiled to himself, collected his books, and crept down to the common room so as not to disturb them any further. Remus! Marlene called. Thank goodness! I'm so stuck on this stupid history question. Which one did you pick? Remus settled down at a desk with the girls. Goblin Rebellion? Troll Uprising! Marlene sighed mournfully. I thought it would be easier. Hmm, Remus replied, sifting through his notes to see what he could get on. Troll Uprising. He found trolls pretty dull himself, but he'd dutifully taken down everything Professor Binns had said, even though Sirius had been passing notes all the way through that lesson. Beautiful. Beautiful. What did that mean? It was a good thing, obviously, a word that could only ever be positive. But Sirius had said it. Worse, he'd said it about Remus's wolf form. So it might mean any number of things. Remus had created a short list in his head. For example, you were beautiful might mean, one, you were beautiful last night as a wolf, but you're not beautiful this morning as a human. Two, you were beautiful last night because I was a dog and dogs are in a good position to judge canine beauty. Three, I'm telling you you were beautiful, even though it isn't true, because I don't want to hurt your feelings. Number four. I think you're beautiful all the time and would very much like to snog you. Remus was willing to admit that option four was the least likely. He finally found the notes and passed them to Marlene. Skim through and let me know if you get stuck. Some of it's a bit confusing, but I've got some good tricks for remembering the key dates. You're a lifesaver, Remus, Marlene gushed, looking relieved. At least you'll finish your transfiguration essay, Mary frowned, looking just as frazzled as Marlene. I'm so behind, I'm going to be up all night. Do you need a hand? Remus asked, reaching for his own transfiguration homework, which just needed a quick proofread before it was ready to hand in. Oh, no thank you, Mary blushed, looking down. Um, Sirius promised to help, actually. You know, because he's really good at transfiguration. Marlene giggled. And he's asked her to go to Hogsmeade with him. Oh, has he? Remus asked, his mouth suddenly very dry. Yeah, Mary grinned, looking very pleased with herself. Remus couldn't blame her. Lucky cow. I know I dumped him before, Mary said in a harsh tone. But we were just kids then. He's much more mature now. Lily gave a sarcastic snort, but didn't look up from her own work. Remus just smiled and nodded, looking down at his charms textbook. He wasn't much in the mood for homework now. Mary and Marlene continued to giggle and whisper about Sirius. Remus gave himself a stern telling off. It wasn't fair to feel the way he did. Not fair to Mary, not fair to Sirius. In fact, it was incredibly selfish. Sirius hadn't spurned him or set out to hurt him deliberately. Quite the opposite. Sirius had gone out of his way to make Remus feel safe and comfortable in his own skin. It was horribly ungrateful of Remus to get upset over a stupid thing like this. Really, it was none of his business who Sirius went to Hogsmeade with. Remus himself had never had any interest in Mary MacDonald, so the churning sick feeling in his stomach was completely out of place. And his friends were allowed to have girlfriends if they wanted. It was normal. Sirius deserved a bit of normality, after the summer he'd had. He thought about it all evening and into the next day, about Mary and Sirius, and... You were beautiful. Would Sirius tell Mary she was beautiful? She was beautiful, it would be a fair statement. Not just her soft curves and chocolate brown eyes, but the spatter of freckles on her nose, her warm brown skin, which had never been spotty, like every other teen in their year, but glowed like mahogany. Her laughter, her humour, her quick wit. She was a good match for Sirius. The thing was, Remus decided, if a boy told a girl she was beautiful, there could really be no doubts about what his intentions were. Boys telling other boys they were beautiful was a bit blurrier, especially when neither party had all the information. 
After all, Remus repeatedly told himself, Sirius had no idea what he'd been up to all summer. As far as Sirius knew, as far as anyone at Hogwarts knew, Remus was just as interested in girls as every other boy his age, so it could be easily read as completely platonic and an innocuous compliment. On the other hand, a small wheedling voice would whisper, Sirius had always known Remus better than Remus knew himself. He had always been able to suss him out. The reading problem, the lycanthropy. Why not this too? Was it so terrible to hope? Saturday, 4th of October, 1975. After a week of restless nights, Remus was desperate for someone to talk to, and this time there was truly no one he could talk to. Everyone knew slightly different shades of Remus, based on the secrets they were aware of. The marauders knew he was a werewolf, but only Sirius knew about his struggles with reading. Lily knew about the reading, but not about the werewolf problem. Mary and Marlene knew least of all, and he liked it that way. There was only one person in the world who knew about his newest secret, and that person was nearly impossible to get in touch with. However, Remus was more than just a werewolf with reading problems and a gargantuan crush on his best friend. Above all things, he was a marauder, and nothing was impossible to a marauder. Last year, Mary had told him there was an old muggle phone box on the outskirts of Hogsmeade, which was still in service. All he needed to do was to get to it without anyone asking where he was going, and make sure Grant was waiting on the other end, back in Essex. The first part was easy. Sirius and Peter would both be occupied on the next Hogsmeade weekend with their respective dates. James, though, he'd asked Lily out several times already this term. He would be a loose end, but much less nosy than Sirius. Remus thought he could get away from him without much effort. Getting a message to St. Edmund's was much more difficult, and in the end, Remus settled for Owling Matron. He wrote her a quick note explaining that he would not be back for Christmas, this was completely redundant, as so far he'd not spent one Christmas in St. Edmund's since he was eleven, but it served his purposes. He enclosed a second envelope addressed to Grant Chapman with an even briefer note. Saturday, 4th of October, phone box on station approach, 12pm. After that, Remus just had to hope for the best. Hogsmeade weekend arrived, and Remus had somewhat forgotten that, as a prefect, he had certain duties to perform, which slowed him down a great deal. He and Lily had to check all of the third year's names off their list of students who had the correct permission slips, then lead them all down to the village. Luckily, James soon grew bored of following Remus down, bringing up the rear of a long line of excitable thirteen-year-olds, and he disappeared off to look at the latest Quidditch supplies. In the end, Remus did not make it to Hogsmeade until half-past twelve, so when Lily was finally satisfied that they'd shepherded the last third year, he had to run as fast as he could to the edge of town, praying no one noticed him. Hogsmeade was the only village for miles and miles around, and there was only one path which led to and from it. Remus suspected his road was seldom used, as the wizards had so many other means of travel. The tall red phone box looked very strange then, standing by itself, surrounded by lush green Scottish hillsides. Remus thanked his lucky stars it was unoccupied. He'd been worried he'd arrived to find some muggle-born student already in there, tying up the line. But no, he was quite alone. He opened the door and stepped inside, punching in the number as quickly as possible. It only rang twice before a crackly voice answered on the other end. It seemed to say. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Remus said loudly into the receiver. Watcher, Remus! Grant's voice returned, slightly tinny, but much clearer and as cheeky and cheerful as ever. Remus felt at ease for the first time in weeks. Thor been waiting an hour in this bloody box. Sorry, Remus said. Took longer than I thought to get away. You got my message then? I did. Very flattered, I must say. Missing me, are you? Of course, Remus said quickly, and he realised he meant it. Sirius had been a distraction of epic proportions, but he had to admit he felt a bit lonely without Grant around. How are you? Same old. How's school? Fine, fine. What's up? Um, I wanted to ask you something. Go for it. Well, you know, that day when we were, um, in the early summer when we were sitting outside and you... You... Snogged your face off? Remus felt himself blushing hard against the cold plastic receiver. 
Uh, yeah, well, I wanted to ask, how did you... No. Oh, God. Grant sighed heavily. Who is it? What do you... You fancy someone, right? Some posh boy at school? And you want me to tell you what signs to look for? See if he fancies you back. Remus blinked. That was pretty much exactly what he wanted. Well, Grant said, Sorry I let you down, my old duck, but I've got nothing for you. Nine times out of ten they don't fancy you back, so don't get your hopes up. Eight times out of ten they'll beat the living daylights out of you if you even try it on. Hope he's not on the rugby team or whatever it is you toffs do. Ah. Uh, no, I don't think he would. He wouldn't. He's my friend, Remus ended lamely. You ever done anything to make you think he's one of us? One of us? Um, not exactly. He got a girlfriend, or is it a boys only school? Always fancy going to one of them. There are girls, Remus sighed. And yeah, he's, um, well, he's actually gone out with a girl today. Ah, uh, well, it don't sound like your luck's in, mate. I mean, he might go both ways, but I don't know how likely that is, to be honest. Yeah, Remus sighed. He called me beautiful, he wanted to say. Surely he couldn't be so cruel as to say a thing like that and not mean it. Through the silence that followed, Grant laughed softly on the other end of the line. Oh, Remus, love. Real stunner, is he? I don't know what to do. Remus replied, closing his eyes and leaning helplessly against the booth. Nothing you can do. It won't last forever, don't worry. You'll move on. Just look after yourself. Thanks. Any time. You back next summer, eh? Yeah. Christmas? Probably not. Shame. Crap here by myself. I have to play footy yesterday. Thought you hated football. No, I just told you that so you like me. Remus laughed. Though the phone call had not taught Remus anything he hadn't already known, he felt a lot better for it. He headed back into Hogsmeade with a spring in his tap, looking forward to a visit to Honeydukes before finding his friends in the Three Broomsticks. Grant was quite right. Of course Sirius was a no-go. Eventually Remus's feelings would cool off. The new positive outlook did not last long. Remus had no sooner set foot back in Hogsmeade when Severus Snape appeared, slinking out from an alleyway between two cottages. Lupin, he said coldly. He looked worryingly calm and collected, his beady eyes fixed on Remus. At fifteen, Snape was even more awkward looking than he had been at eleven. Adolescence had ravaged him. His limbs had grown gangly, his nose was even more hooked, and he had a terrible case of acne, which put Remus in mind of the itching powder prank in first year. All right, Snivellus, Remus huffed, walking past. Foraging in other people's bins, are you? Severus walked alongside him, smirking. What were you doing, leaving Hogsmeade? None of your business, creep. You were gone for almost an hour. Did you follow me? You're up to something. Get lost or I'll give you detention. It's a complete joke that you got made prefect, Severus said, quite out of the blue. Snape had not been made prefect for Slytherin. Though I suppose you're the best of a bad lot. Look, you're not going to get a rise out of me. Remus said through gritted teeth. He would walk faster if he could, but his gammy hip was playing up again. I tell you to bugger off back to your mates, but I know you haven't got any. I know about you, Snape hissed. Care home brat. This care home brat beat you last year at arithmancy and history. I'll find out what you're up to. Well, good luck. Remus knew he'd done a good job of covering his tracks, even if Severus found out he'd made a phone call. What did it matter? I don't really know what's got you wound up, Snivellus. Not enough first years to curse or something. There's something not right about you, Snape said, falling back now as a gang of six years approached. 
Lily doesn't believe me, but I'll work it out. So you watch your back, loony lupin. Remus swore at him and marched off toward Honeydukes, hoping he looked more careless than he felt. Chapter 78 Fifth Year Wishin' and Hopin' He wants a party, obviously, James said, walking between lessons one afternoon. In our dorm? Remus asked, struggling with his ridiculously heavy book bag. Common room, I think. He wants everyone involved. Of course, Remus smiled fondly. He shifted his bag again. Want me to levitate that for you? I levitated Pete all the way up to divination yesterday. Is that how he got that bruise? Remus raised an eyebrow. Not my fault Sirius shut the trap door too soon. Anyway, this birthday party. I think he wants it to be like yours last year. Oh, no. Remus shook his head. I'm not carrying him all the way back from Hogsmeade in that state again. No, still in the common room. I mean, he just wants alcohol. It is his sixteenth. Well, I'm not holding his hair back when he starts puking either, Remus said firmly. James ruffled his hair as a group of girls walked past, all staring at him. Sometimes Remus was glad he had no interest in the opposite sex, because otherwise walking round with the Quidditch captain might be unbearable. No wonder Pete liked to flaunt Desdemona so much. The Sirius and Mary saga was currently at tolerable levels. Nothing had happened during the Hogsmeade visit, as far as Remus knew, and Mary would have most certainly told him if it had. Apparently, she wanted him to prove that he could be a gentleman before she consented to be his girlfriend. A gentleman? Sirius scoffed when the marauders were alone. I speak five languages. I have a family motto. I can ballroom bloody dance. I have twelve sets of dress robes. What more does she want? Now you know my pain, James sighed in response. She wants you to respect her, Peter tried to explain. I do respect her, Sirius said piously. She's got the best tits in the year. That's very respectable. Remus buried his head in his hands to hide the fact that he was smiling, because surely Sirius was never going to get a girlfriend with that attitude. So, James said, now that the girls had passed and they were almost at the Great Hall, Good idea? Big party? Lots of noise? Lots of booze? Lots of girls? Oh yeah? Sounds great, Remus replied half-heartedly. Or oh, I know you're shy, Mooney, but I swear, loads of girls like you. You just need to know how to talk to them. Remus thought that was a bit rich coming from James Oi Evans Potter, but he said nothing. Anyway, James went on, grinning as they entered the hall. You can be the JD, you know, all the music. The DJ, Remus corrected. Whatever. All right, Wormtail. James elbowed Peter, who was sitting with his girlfriend at the Ravenclaw table. She frowned at James. Why have you started calling him that? It's a terrible nickname. Nah, Remus smirked. Suits him right down to the ground. Peter flicked two fingers at them both and returned to his lunch. They'd all been playing about with nicknames, partly because they wanted to finish the map by Christmas and needed the aliases, partly because James and Sirius just liked the idea of having code names. They'd made a game of never calling each other by the same name twice, but after Squeaker, Whiskers, Scabbers and Cheese Muncher had been tested, Wormtail had ended up sticking for Peter. Remus was loving every minute. Now they knew how he felt, though he had to admit he'd grown quite fond of Mooney. They sat at the Gryffindor table. Sirius and Mary were already there, chatting animatedly. Fido, James nodded as he sat. Rudolph, Sirius replied in an identical nod. Where have you two been? Mary asked. Didn't you have a free? Library, Remus said, reaching for the soup ladle, standing to lift the lid on the steaming tureen between them. Tomato, his favourite. You two are acting like we don't have OWLs coming up. I'll do my revision at Christmas, Mary shrugged. I'm not that fast. I'm more nervous about the career interviews. Career interviews? Remus sat down alarmed. Lily was telling me, Mary explained. After OWLs, we have to have a go and meeting with Professor McGonagall about what we want to do after school finishes. No idea what I'll say. If this war carries on, I won't be able to get a job as a muggle-born. You will, James said fiercely. We're going to win. Well, even so, Mary shrugged. I don't know what I want to do when we leave. 
The only wizard job I know anything about is teaching, and I definitely don't want to do that. An owl appeared from somewhere above them, landing beside Sirius's plate. He rolled his eyes. It was a black family owl. At least it's not a howler, James said, cheerfully, buttering his bread roll. Sirius ripped open the white envelope, and Remus watched his blue eyes flicker across the text. He stood up, looking over at the Slytherin table. Mary, Remus, and James all turned to look too. Regulus was watching his brother. Sirius made eye contact with him, raised the letter and his wand, and said, Incendio! Mary yelped as the piece of parchment burst into flames between Sirius's fingers. Sirius sat down, satisfied. Bad news, then? James asked, returning to his lunch. A summons to spend my birthday with my darling brother. Well, is that so bad? James asked. Yes, Remus said sternly. He'd not forgotten the vicious cuts on the back of Sirius's legs. Why did you do that? A voice behind them spoke. Regulus had actually left the Slytherin table to confront his brother. Sirius ignored him, instead continuing to eat his food. Sirius, Regulus said louder this time. Why did you burn that letter? Come on, Mary, Sirius said, standing up again, carefully avoiding eye contact. Let's go. We've got charms next, haven't we? It wasn't from Mum, Regulus said, his eyes over bright and his cheeks turning unnaturally pink. I wrote it myself. I wanted to see you. But Sirius was having none of it and had already swept away from the table, Mary on his arm. I can talk to him if you want, James turned to Regulus. The younger black brother blinked a few times, then glared at James. Remus could see his long eyelashes glittering with angry tears. Piss off, Potter! No one asked you! If he's happy with his mudblood girlfriend, then fine! I don't care! And with that, Regulus gave his own flounce, returning to his friends on the other side of the hall. James sighed heavily, playing with his soup. Real flair for the dramatic, those blacks. Thursday, 30th of October, 1975. Sirius's birthday fell rather unfortunately on a Monday that year, so they decided to hold the party on the Saturday which preceded it. This was not long after the Marauders' second full moon spent together in the Shrieking Shack, which had been just as successful at the last, if not more so, because they were all much more prepared. Remus had managed to get a hold of two bottles of fire whiskey from a seventh year who'd once bought cigarettes from him. James paid, of course. The rest of the Gryffindors were quite used to marauder parties by now, and those who weren't interested were armed with silencing charms for their dorm rooms. Lily did not think this was reasonable. Really, Remus, we can't disrupt the whole house just because it's Sirius's birthday. Why not? Remus yawned. It was late and they were patrolling the fourth floor again. We did it last year and the year before that. Last year it coincided with a Quidditch victory, Lily said. That was a house celebration. Well, so's this. No, this is a serious celebration. Yeah, everyone loves Sirius. Hmm. It was true. Lily was potentially the only Gryffindor who didn't at least find James and Sirius funny. Everyone else loved the idea of a party. You ought to put a stop to it, she said. Why me? Because you're a prefect, Remus. Why do you think they gave you that badge? Believe me, I have no idea. He yawned again. His eyes itched with tiredness. Have we done enough yet? He whinged. Haven't seen any students for ages. Oh, I suppose you're right, Lily said, catching his yawn. I'll just check the girl's loo here, then let's head back. Hmm. Remus leaned against the wall and waited while Lily went in to investigate. She was nothing if not thorough. She clearly loved being a prefect as much as James loved being Quidditch captain. Remus was definitely not enjoying the responsibility, as if he didn't have enough to do with OWLs on the horizon, not to mention full moons, a war, and keeping on guard for vicious Slytherin attacks. Speaking of which... Loitering outside the girls' loose, A voice slithered up from behind him. Remus turned to see Snape coming round the corner. Hoping Moaning Myrtle will go out with you if you ask nicely. Remus groaned and rolled his eyes. 
Oh, piss off, will you? I really will give you detention this time. You're out of bounds. Just try it. Severus narrowed his eyes. Go back to your dorm. Make me. Remus had been doing his utmost to keep his temper under control this year, and he'd been doing fairly well, other than that small altercation with Regulus. But Snape seemed very keen to make himself an exception. Ever since their encounter in Hogsmeade, Remus had noticed the Slytherin student watching him, appearing from behind corners or following him into classrooms. This was the latest in a string of recent ambushes, and Remus's nerves were wearing thin. Fortunately for Severus, at that very moment Lily completed her inspection and walked out of the toilets. Sev, she said, sounding half surprised, half concerned. Her eyes flashed between Snape and Remus. What's going on? I was just telling Snivellers here that he's out of bounds and is going to get a detention for it, Remus said smugly. He knew that Lily was one of the only people Snape cared about, and that the last thing he wanted was to lose face in front of her. Don't call him that, she frowned. You really ought to be on your own common room at this time of night, Lily said to Severus reproachfully. I wanted to make sure you're okay, Severus said smoothly. It isn't safe wandering round the castle with delinquents. Watch it, Snape, Remus withdrew his wand. Watch what, muggle lover? You slimy, filthy- Stop it, both of you! Lily shouted, putting out her own wand. I'll turn you both into mice and you can take your chances with Mrs. Norris. They both stared at her dumbstruck. Quite right, she said, drawing herself up to full height. Now, Severus, go back to the dungeons. Remus, shut up and come with me. With that, she stormed off, plats bouncing behind her like two copper whips. Remus had to walk very fast to catch up and was panting by the time they reached the top of the second staircase. I didn't start it, you know he told her. Old Snivellus has been following me around all year, the slime ball. I don't want to hear it, she snapped. I don't even care who started it any more, you lot or him. I think you're all horrible bullies. Lily, I mean it, Remus. I'll curse you. Girls, Remus thought grumpily as he let her go on ahead, rubbing his poor hip. Mental. Every last one. Saturday, 1st of November, 1975. Well, you can bump and grind, it's good for your mind, you can twist and shout, let it all hang out, but you won't fool the children of the revolution. The Slytherins might all have high-profile careers ahead of them. The Ravenclaws probably kept the coolest heads in an emergency, and if you wanted anything done well, then you could count on a Hufflepuff. But Gryffindor Tower, for a bloody good party. Word had got out, and a steady stream of Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw students were sneaking in through the portrait hole, which was supposed to be manned by Peter, who'd got very drunk very quickly and was apparently extremely hospitable after a few fire whiskies. By ten o'clock, the common room was heaving, awash in dazzling red and gold, full of chatter, laughter and music. Remus had started off in charge of the record player, and had implemented a system based on the way a muggle jukebox works, using a simple levitation locomotor spell combination. However, things had got quickly out of hand, and in the end he'd abandoned his posts in favour of having a good time. Sirius, who was on his third or fourth whiskey by now, was having the time of his life, centre of attention, and surrounded by girls. The Gryffindor girls had been poring over a copy of Marie Claire all afternoon, and Remus noticed they were all dressed very differently for this year's party. Their skirts had got shorter, the colours less conservative, and the makeup was something else. Mary performed a spell on her eyelashes that made them long and thick, like bat's wings. She looked utterly stunning in a royal blue miniskirt and white blouse with long bell sleeves, cut low to accentuate what Sirius called the best tits in the year. Marlene was very striking too, her hair combed out for once, rather than its usual practical ponytail, in white flares and a floaty paisley print top, and even after Lily's outburst the other night, she was smiling and chatting away with everyone else, wearing an emerald green crocheted dress. I think tonight might be the night, you know, James slurred, collapsing in the seat next to Remus like a sack of potatoes. Oh yeah, Remus mused conversationally. And what makes you think that, Prancer? He was running out of Father Christmas reindeer. They were going to have to settle one eventually. Look at her, James gushed. She's obviously trying to get my attention. How? 
Look at her! Oh, yeah, Remus patted his friend's knee indulgently. Yeah, I definitely see it. She's mad for you, mate. I just need to work out how to impress her. James downed the remains of his whiskey. Remus didn't know how many that made, but it wasn't his job to babysit anyone. You could uh, try talking to her about charms, Remus suggested. He was struggling with that banishing incantation last week, and she nailed it on the first go. James looked at him as though he were insane. No, nah. I'll come up with something. Something to really wow her. He got up and wandered away before Remus could try to tell him that Lily Evans probably did not want to be wowed. And anyway, he was distracted at that moment by Sirius, who'd begun dancing with Mary to the final bars of the T-Rex song blaring out. Sirius often joked that the only kind of dancing he did was ballroom, but here was the evidence that it had been a lie. Remus looked away quickly, blushing. Drink, Remus! Marlene now landed beside him, taking James's place. She clutched a bottle of something greenish. What the hell is that? Witch's brew, she smiled, pouring it into his cup. He sipped the fluorescent green liquid. It was very sweet and had a slight apple taste. Definitely alcoholic. That's gonna make me sick, he grinned. Ugh, look at him, Marlene sighed, watching Sirius dancing. Could those jeans be any tighter? Remus mumbled something into his cup, taking another gulp. She's definitely going to go out with him again, Marlene said. Mary always gets what Mary wants. I thought you fancied James. Eh, well, they're both pretty gorgeous, to be honest. I swing back and forth, but Potter's so gaga for Lily, it hardly seems worth it. Plus, I'm on a Quidditch team, aren't I? I'll never hear the end of it if I went out with Captain. There are other boys, Remus said. Not like Sirius. She lay her head on his shoulder dopily. He finished his drink in one go and allowed her to pour him some more. He was getting a taste for it, whatever it was. Remus had always liked sweet things. The T-Rex song finally ended and the next album spun itself out of its sleeve and fluttered onto the table. Wishing and hoping and thinking and praying, planning and dreaming each night of his charms. Oh, God! Remus moaned. Who put on Dusty Springfield? I'll lob this one, Mary sat up smiling. Sure enough, the bouncy pop record had an amazing effect on every other girl at the party as they began to bop along to the tune, singing along loudly. Remus considered taking the moment to nip upstairs for a cheeky fag, but Marlene hoisted him to his feet. Come on, darling, let's have a dance. She flung her arms round his neck. I'll pretend you're a tall, handsome stranger and you can pretend I'm Raquel Welch or something. Remus was unsteady on his feet at the best of times, but after mixing drinks all evening, and with Marlene hanging off him, giggling and swinging him about, it was all he could do to cling on for dear life. Yeah, Mooney! Sirius crowed as he and Mary moved closer to them. I never knew you could dance! Oh yeah, I'm the next Fred Astaire! Remus raised an ironic eyebrow, holding Marlene's hand over her head as she twirled round, then struggled to regain her balance. You're such a sweet couple, Mary said, leaning into Sirius. Remus shook his head, snorting with laughter. Oi! Evans! James had re-emerged, apparently ready to enact his plan. The whole room turned to look at him, standing on top of one of the study tables with his broom held aloft. Oh no, Remus breathed. Oh yes, Sirius cheered. Potter! Lily Evans shouted. Get down from there! You'll hurt yourself! Watch this! James cried gleefully, thrilled by the attention. He leapt onto his broom and soared upward at an astonishing rate. He's never fallen off before, Marlene said uncertainly as James began to take a series of loops and dives, each shakier than the last. Has he ever been drunk before, though? Mary countered. He's fine! Sirius laughed. They all watched as James flew round and round the rafters, faster and faster, until Remus's neck hurt and he was in danger of whiplash. Eventually, Lily Evans had had enough. Petrificus totalis, she commanded, pointing her wand at James. He stopped at once, freezing in midair, 
but Lily was incredibly deft and switched seamlessly to a levitation charm, lowering him slowly to the ground. She set him down on the carpet and stood over him, hands on her hips. He blinked up at her, unable to speak, but full of plain adoration. You idiot, she said. Ten points from Gryffindor and a week's detention. And with that, she left him on the carpet and returned to her friends. Remus unpetrified James and helped him to his feet, handing him another whiskey. The music had died down now. It sounded like Fairport Convention. Tough luck, mate, he said, trying to sound sympathetic. What do you mean? James grinned back, slightly dazed, but no worse for wear. Didn't you see how she looked at me? Uh, yeah. Smitten, he murmured, staggering backwards slightly until Remus guided him to an armchair. Totally smitten. Drink your drink, James. Cheers, Mooney. You're the best. Hmm. Mooney replied, watching Mary wrap her arms round Sirius's neck and lay her head against his chest as they danced slowly. I'm the best. Chapter 79, Fifth Year, Jealous Moon Thursday, 18th of December, 1975 I'd like that essay back in January. Yes, Mr. Pettigrew. That is in addition to the one on the pitfalls of the Gemino curse. McGonagall gave a thin smile that was anything but sympathetic. Peter looked pretty dreadful, but the whole class felt it. Their workload had grown so enormous in the run-up to Christmas that Sirius had had to perform a shrinking charm on his books, notes, and papers just to fit them all under his bed. Remus felt that this was only a short-term solution. If Sirius actually took everything out and organized it for once, he'd have no problem fitting it all neatly on his assigned shelves. Remus, who had never really owned enough things to make a mess with them, hated untidiness. Some nights he thought that the state of Sirius's bed was more distracting than the boys sleeping in it. Marlene was particularly distressed as they left the classroom for potions. I just can't work out the duplication part. It's so confusing. There's an easy way to get the pronunciation right, Remus said, struggling with his heavy bag again. His shoulders were very sore this week in the run-up to the moon. I can show you before we leave for Christmas if you want. Oh, yes, please, Marlene nodded gratefully. You make everything so easy to understand. Tonight? No, I can't tonight, he said smoothly. Friday? Oh, OK. I'll have to get all my packing done tonight, though. Still got presents to wrap up for Mum and Danny. This year, Remus had neatly wrapped every one of his Christmas gifts the moment he'd bought them, too excited to wait. Now he was looking forward to two uninterrupted weeks at the Potters with James and Peter. Sirius had been summoned home in a howler earlier in the term. Remus was conflicted about this. Of course, he was deeply concerned for his friend, who was sure to have a terrible time. But on the other hand, two weeks without Sirius taking up all the air in the room would be a welcome relief for Remus, whose willpower was starting to fall. For example, just now, as he stood outside the dungeon entrance chatting to Marlene, it was taking every ounce of his energy not to stare directly over her shoulder to where Mary and Sirius were locked in a very passionate embrace which was bordering on obscene. They had been like that since Sirius's birthday. Every moment in each other's company seemed to be spent tongue-wrestling, much to James's disgust. "'Evans, can you stop them?' he asked, leaning against the wall, put out. "'I want my friend back.' There's nothing in the rules about public displays of affection, Potter, Lily said, grimacing. Don't you think I've checked? Fortunately, at that moment, Slughorn opened the door to the classroom and Remus hurried inside. He and Lily shared a desk at the front of the room, so at least he didn't have to see Sirius and Mary making eyes at each other all lesson. The only saving grace was that at least Sirius didn't talk about her when she wasn't there, like Peter did with Desdemona or James with Lily. Remus had begun looking forward to late nights in their dorm room, when he could pretend nothing at all had happened. Potions was dull as usual. Remus had plans to drop the subject as soon as he could after OWLs were finished with. He would pass by the skin of his teeth, if at all, only thanks to Lily. Slughorn gave them yet another assignment due in January. At this rate, I'll be writing essays during Christmas dinner, Lily sighed as they packed away their things. I can't wait for OWLs to be over. Can you? I suppose we'll just have to start work on any WTs once these are finished, 
Remus replied pessimistically. And Dirk Cresswell told me we won't get our OWL results until the end of summer. What? Oh no, that's going to ruin my holiday. Dad wants to take us all down to Cornwall in the caravan and I was really looking forward to it. Remus nodded gravely. Even though it was not yet Christmas, he'd been looking forward to the summer holidays too. Two long, warm, simple months with Grant sounded like utter bliss. He'd written Grant a Christmas card, but hadn't made up his mind whether or not to send it. There was nothing interesting inside, just a standard festive greeting, but he was shy about it. Grant might think it was silly. Remus had been carrying it around in his book bag for a week. So what are you up to tonight? Lily asked as they left the classroom on their way to lunch. Hmm, nothing. I heard you tell Marlene you were busy and we're not on the rota for patrol tonight. Oh, uh, something else. Detention. Remus, you never get detention, Lily asked. Lily laughed. Come on, what is it? A prank? A secret affair? Remus gave a mysterious smile, which he hoped was something like James and Sirius's. Ask me no questions and I'll tell you no lies. Just try not to break any laws. She grinned back, elbowing him gently. Remus tutted as if he would never consider such a thing. Really, it was James, Sirius, and Peter who were breaking the law. He was just an innocent werewolf bystander. Evans, Mooney! James joined them as they reached the Great Hall. May I join you for lunch, or are you the only two people in my life not currently snogging? Oi, what am I, Scotch Miss? Marlene nudged him as they sat down. My apologies, McKinnon, James bowed graciously. I thank you for maintaining your decorum, unlike some, I should mention. He balled up Serviette and threw it at Sirius's head. Lovebirds! Get a bloody room, we're trying to eat! It had no effect. It's pretty brave of her snogging him all over the castle like that, Marlene mused. Or brave of him, I'm not sure. Either way, pure blood and a muggle-born, flaunting their relationship. What's that supposed to mean? Lily said, bristling like an angry cat. Mary is every bit as good as Sirius Black. Blood status has nothing to do with that. Obviously, I know that, Marlene said defensively. But, well, see for yourself. She glanced over at the Slytherin table. A number of Slytherins, Regulus among them, was watching the excessive display of affection taking place at the Gryffindor table. As a muggle-born, Mary had been a target for most of her school career, but it was clear that the disapproval had amped up since she started going out with the heir to one of the oldest pure-blood families in Britain. It was deeply unnerving the way they were all staring like that, narrow eyes and clenched fists, all of them except Snape, who was watching Remus. Bloody hell, James muttered. Bunch of weirdos. I'm worried about her, Marlene bit her lip. If she gets cornered in the halls and Sirius isn't there... We'll look out for her, James said gallantly. He looked at Remus and Lily. Right? Of course, Remus nodded at once. Uh, yeah, Lily said more slowly. She had a funny look on her face as James caught her eye, as if she'd seen something which surprised her. Obviously. We all care about Mary. We won't let anything happen. Uh. He's late, Remus grumbled, wrapping his arms round himself and pacing. He's off snogging MacDonald. He's not coming. He'll be here, Mooney. Give him a minute. I don't have a minute, Remus snapped. His nerves were raw. He didn't have the patience to be polite. I need to go and see Madame Pomfrey now. Okay, well, you go. We'll follow, James said. If Black doesn't show up, then me and Pete will come by ourselves. It'll still work. I'm big enough to control you. Remus didn't like the idea of that, but he was in too bad of a mood. He was just about to storm out of the room when the door swung open, almost hitting him in the face. Oops, sorry I'm late, Sirius said. His hair was out of place and his cheeks were pinkish. Remus regarded him with disgust. I have to go, he said through gritted teeth. Yeah, I know. I'm really sorry, Mooney, Sirius tried a charming smile. I was just with Mary and I haven't got time for this. Remus left at once, marching purposefully down the stairs. Any time of the month, any time at all, other than the full moon, and Remus could have kept all the plates spinning. His desire for Sirius, his jealousy of Mary, his loneliness for someone to talk to. Just now it was all a bit too much. He barely spoke to Madame Pomfrey all the way to the shack, and once they were halfway there he realised he could smell his friends, all three following them under the invisibility cloak. 
Trying hard to shake off his temper and appear calm, he refocused his thoughts on Christmas with the Potters, the scent of clove and orange, the thick juicy currants in Mrs. Potter's fruitcake, velvety white royal icing, the warmth of the fireplace. He felt a lot better by the time Madame Pomfrey was locking him in. I'm really sorry, Mooney, a voice said moments before Sirius James and Peter appeared as if out of nowhere. Sirius stepped forward guiltily. I won't do it again. It's fine, Remus shrugged, hearing the click in his joints as he did so. You made it in time. Everything's fine. Tell you what, Sirius grinned at them all. Snogging's really Moorish, once you get the hang of it. James and Peter laughed. Remus smiled politely as he could. He desperately wished he could tell them all the truth, that he wasn't the priggish, inexperienced boy they thought he was, that he actually knew exactly how much fun it was to be kissed for hours, the impossible intimacy of having someone to cling to. More than that, he knew how it felt when it was gone. Where does she think you are now? James asked Sirius. Detention, obviously. Gotta maintain my bad boy persona. Of course you do, Snuffles. Oh, piss off, buckaroo! Remus closed his eyes as pain shot through his body. He bit his lip and rolled back on the bed. Better change, he said to his friends. See you in a bit. Friday, 19th of December, 1975. Bloody hell, Mooney, I'm not a fan of that bit, Sirius was saying softly, guiding Remus back into his bed. Mm, not my favourite part either, Remus responded, wincing against the morning light. Sorry, it must be crap to watch. He dislocated a shoulder again. What would happen when he finished school and Madame Pomfrey couldn't fix him any more? Would he have to go to a hospital? Were there wizard hospitals? It was good, though, James was saying somewhere else in the room. You were trusting us more and more. Yeah, Sirius agreed. I reckon in the new year we can try leaving this place. What? Start exploring. There's acres and acres of forest out there to explore, Mooney. You deserve it. Hmm. Remus couldn't think straight. He was too tired, too sore. See you later, James whispered just as Remus fell asleep. When he woke up, he was already in a hospital bed. His arm was mended and he felt fit as a fiddle. What was more, it was the very last day of term, and tomorrow he would be boarding the Hogwarts Express back to London, then off to the Potters. He smiled to himself. He could not remember having been so happy in a very long time. When had he ever woken up from a full moon without a new scar? When had he ever had a Christmas to look forward to with a loving family? He might even have a go on James's old broom if someone bribed him with a bit of chocolate. Good afternoon, Mr Lupin, Madame Pomfrey called out. She must have some kind of sixth sense. She always knew when he was awake. Good afternoon, he called back with a mild croak. He and Sirius had been howling together, he remembered. It had been a lovely thing, like singing. Another very good night, the Meddy Witch approached his bed. I'll fetch you some lunch, but you're free to go. Merry Christmas, my dear. Merry Christmas, he smiled up at her. He would leave her gift on the bed. He was too shy to hand it over in person. Chapter 80, Fifth Year T'was the night before Christmas Saturday, 20th of December, 1975 I will literally curse both of you with a lip-locking charm if you plan to do that all the way to London, Lily said, raising her wand to Sirius and Mary. Her deadpan expression was very hard to read, and the couple quickly disentangled. Mary stuck out her tongue cheekily. You too, Wormy. James held up his own wand, grinning at Lily like a lunatic. Peter and Desdemona moved apart too, smiling sheepishly. The carriage was extremely cramped. Remus was squashed up against the window next to James, with Sirius and Mary by the door. On the opposite row of seats, Lily and Marlene were squeezed in beside Peter and Desdemona. We're just saying goodbye, Mary smirked, laying her head on Sirius's shoulder. It's only two weeks and you can write to each other, Lily replied smartly. Uh, actually, better if none of you write to me, Sirius said. I'm not exactly likely to get letters, anyway, and unless you want my dear mother reading them. You've got the mirror, though, James said seriously. You can get in touch with us if you need to. Yeah, of course. Sirius smiled at him reassuringly, patting his breast pocket. 
Remus stared out the window, pressing his forehead on the cold glass. The train moved sluggishly down to London. They passed the phone box he'd used to call Grant, and he felt a pang of guilt for not phoning him again since then. He'd been so busy with everything else in the end that he hadn't sent the Christmas card. Grant was supposed to be studying at the local secondary modern, but at 16 he could leave whenever he wanted. Remus tried to convince him over the summer to finish his CSEs, even maybe take a GCE if he could, but Grant had just laughed at him, as if education was one of Remus's particular eccentricities. Matron usually got the St. Edmund's boys' apprenticeships where they showed an aptitude for handiwork, but Remus couldn't remember Grant ever mentioning the things he was good at, only the things he struggled with, like maths and English. And Remus couldn't very well tell Grant any of his best subjects, could he? The boys who didn't get apprenticeships had to find their own way once they turned 18. Remus wasn't sure. Oi, Mooney, wakey, wakey, Sirius barked, wrenching Remus out of his daydream. Trolley's here. Don't want to miss lunch, do you? No, cheers. Remus turned back to the noisy, overwarm carriage where James was buying at least 12 pasties on top of all the sweets they could manage. We'll never get through all this, Lily scolded, smiling slightly. You've clearly never seen Mooney eat, James winked. Oh, I wish I had your metabolism, Remus, Desdemona said. My mother's always telling me I ought to start dieting. Nothing wrong with having curves, Mary said, taking a huge bite of her own pasty. Gives them something to hold on to. The girls all giggled, even Lily, who was blushing hard. Remus wished the journey would soon be over. Of course, as the train pulled into King's Cross, he felt a horrible twist to his insides as Sirius fell quiet, his face pinched and pale. The girls and Peter all hurried to gather their things, eager to meet their families on the platform. Remus and James were deliberately slow, waiting until Mary had finally left the car, then helping Sirius with his own bags. Check in every evening, right? James gripped his best friend's shoulder. If I don't hear from you, I'm sending help. Sirius grinned gratefully. I'll be fine. Nothing I haven't done before. Please be careful, Remus burst out. Keep your head down. Don't be so... so... you. Sirius laughed. Sound advice, Mooney. Remus lowered his gaze, smiling bashfully. He wanted to hug him, but it was too late. Regulus was standing in the open doorway, arms folded. Ready? Sirius nodded and did not turn back. James and Remus watched the brothers leave. They were almost the same height now. Regulus had a slimmer build, perhaps, but from behind they could be twins. He'll be okay, James said, and Remus instinctively knew he was reassuring himself more than anything else. After a moment, James was back to normal. He grabbed his suitcase handle, and Remus's too, without a word, and exhaled. Come on then, Mooney. Let's do Christmas. Wednesday, 24th of December, 1975. It did not snow over Christmas of 1975 either. Fortunately, it didn't rain, which meant, to James anyway, that conditions were perfect for lots and lots of Quidditch practice. Remus gave in and did as he was instructed. It took both their minds off Sirius. Remus was never going to be any great shakes at flying, but after the first few days in the air, he at least wasn't terrified of falling anymore. He even managed to get a quaffle past Peter once. Between drills, the boys enjoyed all of the festive trimmings Remus had come to expect from a typical Potter Christmas. Tinsel, lights, wrapping paper, late nights eating buttered tea cakes, hearty dinners, and bright mornings. Mr. and Mrs. Potter were as delightful as ever, though it was evident that their ongoing involvement in Dumbledore's resistance movement was taking its toll. Mr. Potter didn't join them outside as much, but locked himself in his study. When he emerged, he moved stiffly, his back bent, no longer the sprightly mischief-maker he'd been only three short years ago. Mrs. Potter, who was still everything a mother ought to be, had more silver hair than Remus remembered and dark rings under her eyes. She still always had a smile for the boys when they came in from the cold. "'James, go and get your father. It's time for supper. Have you spoken to Sirius today? Send him our love, will you? Remus, you look frozen through. Go and stand by the fire for a little bit and warm up. I've put out an extra chop for you, so make sure you eat it. I don't know how you boys keep growing the way you do. Hello, Peter, love. Staying for tea? Make sure your mother knows. They were speaking to Sirius as much as possible. Every night, Remus and James would kneel on James's bed with the mirror lying open between them and wait for their friend to appear. It was always an immense relief when he did, those wicked blue eyes and cheeky grin promising them he was okay. 
Reg's being a complete prat as usual, and Mother is an eternal delight, but nothing out of the ordinary. The trouble was, Remus thought, pursing his lips, neither he nor James really understood what ordinary meant in the Black household, so there was no way of knowing how much danger Sirius was in. Can't say much, Sirius would whisper after his brief updates. Anyone could be listening. Bloody portraits of spies here. He looked tired. Wish we could just go and get him, James would say hopelessly. Me too, Remus nodded along. Every night the same. The final night they heard from Sirius was the night right before Christmas Eve. Was that the eve of Christmas Eve? Remus found himself thinking childishly. Something Grant might say to make Remus laugh. The irony of it all was that on that night, the 23rd of December 1975, Sirius was in high spirits. In fact, Remus might go as far to say he sounded positive, optimistic. They're being okay today, actually, he smiled up through the compact mirror. Actually sort of nice, friendly. Dad smiled at me. I don't know if Dad has ever smiled at me. They keep talking about moving past our problems as a family. That's good. James smiled back encouragingly. Maybe the war has knocked some sense into them. Traditional Christmas Eve dinner tomorrow night, Sirius said. All the blacks in one place. Joy. I should be able to get away for our usual time. Just don't laugh at my stupid dress robes, okay? James and Remus smiled and promised not to laugh. They went to bed that night feeling reassured, looking forward to their Christmas Eve plans. These plans, of course, involved more Quidditch practice, but thankfully only an hour of it. Afterwards, Mrs. Potter called them in and requested they fetch the nice china from the attic, along with the big Christmas tablecloth. With everything going on, I'm so behind this year, she murmured, stirring a bowl of mincemeat ready for pies. Remus noticed that her fingernails were bitten down to the quick. Have we got many people coming this year, Mum? James asked as he carefully unloaded the box of china plates and bowls, handing them to Remus for a quick rinse under the tap. Hmm, well, Darius, of course. He'll always show for a hot dinner if one's on offer. Remus scowled but said nothing. Mrs. Potter continued. I've invited the Boneses and the Tonkses, but everyone seems to want to keep to themselves this year. The Pettigrews will be over, I imagine. Perhaps some from the Ministry, your father's friends. Dumbledore? No, dear, he'll be busy. Remus was glad of this. Dumbledore was so serious these days, and his name always seemed to be spoken with a sense of dread. He brought bad news. The Potters were such nice people, why couldn't they invite the nice teachers, like Professor Flitwick, or even Professor Farox? Though Remus mused as he wiped down a large serving dish, he was probably just plain old Mr. Farox now. Or Leo. That was his given name, according to Mary. Leo Farox. Sirius Black. Maybe Remus just had a thing for cool names. After dinner, James and Remus convened on James's bed again at their usual time for their appointment with Sirius. But when James opened the mirror, nothing appeared, only their own reflections. He had that dinner, Remus said, though it didn't feel right. He might be late. So they waited. After half an hour, most of which they spent in anxious silence, James tried speaking softly into the mirror. Sirius? he called. Are you there? Nothing. I don't like it, James said. Remus didn't know what to say. Come on, James got up. I'm telling Dad. Mr. Potter frowned when he heard, but wasn't much help. You can't jump to any conclusions, James. You said all was well yesterday. Yeah, but I've been to Black Family Banquets before, Mr. Potter said thoughtfully. They run late, especially if Orion is presiding. Man likes to hear himself speak, not unlike Sirius. We'll wait up a bit longer, Mrs. Potter said, smoothing down her son's hair lovingly. Let's have some tea. Come sit by the fire. They did. Gully the house elf came in with the tea tray, laden with the steaming pot and a plate of biscuits too, but neither James nor Remus was in the mood to eat. The hour grew later and later. The Potters had a grandfather clock in the hall, and Remus could hear it ticking away mercilessly. The compact mirror lay open in James's lap, reflecting only the flickering orange of the fireplace. Even James's parents looked nervous now. Mr. Potter got up a few times and paced. Mrs. Potter kept bustling about the room, straightening the ornaments on the mantelpiece or rearranging the brightly packaged presents under the tree. 
At eleven o'clock, an owl came screeching out of the black night toward the living room window, and it was only Mrs. Potter's quick thinking and speedy wand work that stopped it from shattering the glass. It was a huge, stately eagle owl, the same kind the blacks used. It wailed, agitated, and clearly exhausted from its journey. James wrestled the note from its legs and tore it open. His eyes widened and he let out a strange, strangled noise. Remus jumped up to read over his shoulder. He's in trouble. Please help. R.A.B. Effie, send for Dumbledore at once, Mr. Potter said, joining Remus at James's side. Remus began to tremble. He'd never known terror like it. He wanted to scream, shout, hit something. James was the same, he could tell. He turned white as a sheet, reading that note over and over. We need to go, James said, his voice broken. We need to go and get him, now! We will, Mr. Potter said. Just stay calm. Remus laughed. It was hugely inappropriate, but no one seemed to notice. Stay calm. There was no time for anything else. The fireplace crackled loudly, then blazed bright emerald green. Mr. Potter put his arms round both boys and pulled them back sharply. A chaos of noise and shouts echoed through the chimney flue from another fireplace and another house. The body of Sirius Black tumbled out of the flames and onto the carpet at their feet.